we're going to start off by doing a lightning round, but um, we have a video that uh, we had made up um, from our communications department. We wanted to get a highlight, uh, a lot of our projects at Clinton and Ida, um, which is kind of rushed, but we got a couple of projects we wanted to show. If you guys want to take a few minutes while you guys are still eating to essentially watch um, a video on about three or four of our programs uh, in Native Lands and Resources Department. We are here doing a shellfish biomass survey at Amalga Beach. What that means is we are trying to determine the shellfish population for three subsistence species. This is our first one. It is a cockle, then a little neck, and a butter clam. The little necks and butter clams look similar, but a butter clam only has horizontal lines, and a little neck will have horizontal lines and vertical lines, and so it makes a crosshatch pattern. At each point, we go around and dig a square, one foot by one foot square, um, to see how many shellfish are in that location. And so once we get the shellfish, we'll note the species, the length, and the weight. Another little neck. That's a cool looking little neck. I know. I'd put this one at... 53. We do this work at the lowest tides of the season. Um, and so right now it was a negative 3.6. The work that we're doing, we do it at a low tide so that way we can access the shellfish. As you can see, we're right here at the water line and that's where we're finding a lot of our larger shellfish species. As the tide moves in, we will move up and dig further up the beach. There we go. Accessing it at a low tide, make sure if we get more data. This is a beach that we know people come and collect their shellfish here for subsistence purposes. And so what we're doing is we're trying to determine the population of the shellfish. So that way we can make sure that it's a healthy population and make sure people are still able to harvest for years to come. Well, I just love being out in the field and being able to collect information that's usable for the public. Um, I really like working with the shellfish. It's really important to be doing work with traditional foods and we're doing some really cool work that is um, complements traditional ecological knowledge as well. For you know thousands of years harmful algal blooms have been around and been accumulating in shellfish and the work that we're doing is kind of giving us numbers and scientific data that complements the knowledge that a lot of indigenous communities already know. There's some sage and some thyme. I love plants. It's a way to nurture not just myself and a connection with nature, but also our community. I mean, when people are just around plants, not just healthy for your body, but also for your spirit. Hi, my name is Amy Erfling. I'm the Regional Greenhouse Coordinator with Clinkett and Haida. I really believe that having these localized regional food systems, especially in Southeast Alaska, is very important for our communities to make them healthier and more resilient. And food brings everybody together, and it's not just cultivated food, it's also having our wild foods. So I think the easiest way to do this will be just to cut it and then come and clip the leaves. And we're putting them in water so they don't start wilting right away. So we're harvesting spinach and arugula. Right now, it's primarily going to the elders' lunch. And so I'm bringing it down to the smokehouse. And then all the great people there are um, putting that into the elders' luncheon program. So you want to dry it before you put it in whatever container it's going to be in, because otherwise it'll get mushy. So we're trying to dry it the best we can before we put it in um, a tote or bags or whatever you're going to keep it in. You know, we're really hoping to expand this program, not just greenhouses, but also adding beds outdoors, because we'd like to Start like potatoes, for example. We're hoping to do like a clink of potato project with a traditional food security. And you can't really grow those indoors in a greenhouse very well because they like those cooler temperatures to set tubers. So we, it would be great to have some outdoor space as well um, to really be doing some of that more regenerative agriculture outdoors. So we're just hoping to expand that, not just here 
output to other communities throughout Southeast. Everybody within the community benefits from having nutritious food that isn't barged up. Today we're on the Klahini River, which is a tributary into the Chilkat River that uh, goes into Upper Lynn Canal. Um, this is Klinkit on E. So there's, uh, it's just upstream from the village of Kwakwan. And then, of course, the Chilkat also goes past uh, Haynes, Alaska as well. We are collecting baseline data. We've been sampling since 2015 in four different rivers in southeast. So this one we started in 2018, and we're collecting data of what's in the river right now. We're mainly testing for heavy metals, but we also collect, we use our YSI meter to collect salinity, pH, conductivity, temperature, and then we do grab samples with a pole sampler in this turbid water. The folks that work at Central Council of Clinkett and Haida and the Natural Resources Department really care about uh, water quality. My favorite part is teaching them how to collect scientifically valid information that then they can build and, and write reports on. And so that's kind of the rewarding part is that you're building their skill set and, uh, and having you know, them actually go out and do the work. Data sovereignty is really important. We are putting our data into a, a website. We've contracted somebody to make for us, so we own our own data. If we were to put it in like the EPA a website, um, the EPA would end up owning it. The tribe has been working on this for a number of years and has been able to fund a lot of the transboundary rivers in southeast Alaska and that doesn't always happen. There are, are a lot of other places across the United States that you just don't have information about what that river looked like before development happened in and around it and so I think it's a really good example of being proactive and having data that the tribe collects and essentially owns. My favorite part is getting to work with the locals like we have Daniel here today from Chilkat Indian Village, and we also work with Luke Williams from Chilkoot Indian Association. We're all tribes with the same goal, keeping our environment healthy, and many voices is better than one. Thank you guys. Uh, just a quick, that was just a quick highlight of some of our programs at uh, in the Native Lands and Resources Department, and I'd like to thank Heather Hens at the Communications Department for doing the video, and Amy and Brandy and Jesse, and our interns um, for, for being a part of that. Uh, right now, we're gonna move into a, a lightning round, kind of just quick discussion. Um, Ralph Wolf, our R Regional Resource Director, uh, who's developing our gardens project, uh, used to be with the South Sea Sustainable Partnership, has a, a little interactive part for this morning. Yeah, thank you, thanks Ray. And just to help us kind of get talking and <clears throat> get get thoughts going around today, uh, we're going to call on a couple partners to give brief kind of project descriptions and what they've been up to this summer or what they're looking forward to coming down this fall. So as Rig gets the mic ready, I'll put it out there first. If anyone wants to volunteer to give a uh, like three to five minute update, on some projects they feel really cool about. Otherwise, I'll just start calling people out. My the choice is do. yours. <laughs> Going once. Okay, who we want to go with first? I see Barb right here. Par yeah. Project partner, there we go. operational update. Yeah, updates. Well, we provided the big SAS FM update the other day, right? So hopefully most of you were there for our presentation and um, just can't stress enough the importance of the upcoming forest plan revision. That forest plan is a decade long, at a minimum, guiding document for the Tongass National Forest, which is homeland and um, the backdrop of our lives here in Southeast. So I just want to stress the importance of, of engagement as that forest plan gets written collaboratively with all of us and all of you. 
Um, what else do I have for updates? I have a new job coming up. I'm going to be um, the deputy forest supervisor for the Tongass National Forest starting on September 11th. So that's kind of big news. I'm not, um, but I'm taking most of the Southeast Alaska sustainability strategy stuff with me. I won't be focused as much on the one USDA approach, but I'll be making sure the sustainability strategy principles of listening meaningfully to tribes and um, engaging with local voices and ensuring that um, we collaborate meaningfully and deeply, that that comes with me into my new role. Anything else? Any other questions about SAS, Congress? Otherwise, I'm going to pass it back to Ralph or Ray. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Okay, I made a quick list here. Mr. Jones, Kazan. Any interesting projects you guys got coming up at Kazan that might be interesting to the group or moving forward? Something that excites you? I would pass that over to our IGAP department. Uh... <laughs> Ooh, delegation at its yeah. best. Yes. Hi, I'm Carol Fletcher. I'm from the Organized Village of Kazan. I'm the environmental coordinator. Um, this next year, I think we're going to focus more on um, uh, water quality and uh, more recycling and uh, air monitoring um, and building our department up a little bit bigger uh, since I'm going solo right now. So yeah, I'm going to work on um, building our department up so yeah. we can get these projects rolling and, and going. Thank you. Carol, uh, in your upcoming water quality projects, what kind of um, work do you have in mind on that? Well, we want to do ocean acidification, um, add that to it, and uh, testing the water, you know, uh, continue with our HABS program and stuff, but um, ocean acidification out there um, since we haven't done that yet. So we're going to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Since Lindsay's right there, I see Mr. Clonot from Klukwan. So in the village of Klukwan, we just recently had a two and a half, three day workshop covering landslides, flooding, some of the issues that came up after the big one in Haines. We, I think, just wrapped up our agreement with Quinkin and Hyde the underwater quality. I think we need to do some more paperwork on it to hopefully keep going. Yep. Yeah. Need to do a new quap. It's just fun to say quap. <laughs> and the ever going battle with the potential mine that's 12 miles upriver. Lots of fun. The question was, what is Daniel writing a quap on? Daniel isn't writing a quap on anything. <laughs> Morgan's writing a quap. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, with that interesting sidebar, I'll call on Carrie to give a seat tour. Carrie. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie. I work with the Tribal Consortium here in Southeast. The first thing I'm going to do is text Morgan and ask her what she's writing a quap on. Um, that's one of the services that CEDAR can do for tribes in the region. Writing quaps is kind of hard, difficult, time consuming, not straightforward. Like you wouldn't believe the amount of stuff you got to write in there if you want to like tie your shoes in the morning to go out in the field. Um, but this is something that we can help with. We have a handful of quaps already written, and so we can uh, beg and borrow from those for some of the general infrastructure. So if there are projects that you want to do that you need a quap for to do under your EPA IGAP work, um, connect with me, let me know, because I can work with you. We can move that bar forward together. Um, and not just me, right? Like Ruben. Ruben's been working on a quap up in Skagway for, I think, some of the water quality stuff that he's doing. And then uh, Brandon in Petersburg has been working on a quap for some of the microplastics work as well. 
So there's a lot of opportunity to leverage individual quaps we have going on in the region. And that way we can write them in. So we're all listed. So we only have to write one and we just have to chase down signatures on the first couple of pages. So <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? Oh, did she? Okay, let's look. Oh, she says she can comment on the quap and water testing. Um, so I think I'll just, I'll, maybe I'll just finish with my update here and then we'll jump back to Morgan so she can tell us about that quap. Um, the other thing that Cedar's doing, you know, we sort of really consider the, the core projects to be the projects we've been working on since 2013, 2014, which is the harmful algal bloom and uh, shellfish toxin work. So we, a big goal of mine is to make sure that the Sika Tribe of Alaska Environmental Research Lab is always funded and has what they need to test your shellfish for you for free. I remember in the first couple of years, y'all remember I was like, give me $2,500. And it was like, a, it felt bad and it was hard. And like, I hated having to take from your IGAP. Um, so a big goal is to make sure we have other grants to support that work. So you folks don't have to take from your IGAP accounts to make sure that those shellfish get tested. Um, Hopefully really, really soon, we're gonna have some of that OA data out for you. Paul Cook at the Sika Tribe Lab has been in the formal bathroom that is now the Berkelader Lab. And um, he's been having a lot of success this summer running through a lot of samples. So we should have some of those data to give back to you all. And that'll be, we'll have to, we'll have to find a, a really a good way to do that that feels good because shellfish data can be a little more black and white. Is it above the regulatory limit? Is it below the regulatory limit? And it turns out ocean chemistry information is not that simple and straightforward. So it's going to look different for everyone. So we'll have to have some more conversations on outreach and connections on those data. The other big project, like I was speaking about yesterday, is hearing from you folks. Um, European green crab is on the top of everybody's mind, particularly folks in southern southeast. Um, folks on the outer coast where some of those currents when um, when they showed the image yesterday with the Nike shoes on where those can move. So, you know, those currents can put green crab well above Southern Southeast, maybe even before they're found in other locations in Southern Southeast, we just don't know. So we've got that permit established for you folks to go out. And now I'd like to get um, training opportunities. So we have some funding from NOAA um, right now for me and some other folks to go down to Prince of Wales Island and do a training on that. We have been reached out to by the Forest Service um, and we applied for like $70,000 to do a collaboration to cover um, some partners, particularly on Prince of Wales and Southern Southeast, um, to cover 25% of your time to do green crab work, if that's something you want to fold in. And it's all baseline data collection because we don't know anything about it. So just a just a slight amendment on our IGAP grant. It's not a problem to our new EPA IGAP officer in the room. Uh, it's totally doable. Um, so those are some of the big projects. We got to go easy on him. He's brand new. I know that's what I was telling him. It's not a problem. It's baseline data collection. It's just a small amendment and we can make uh, budget changes at the staff level. Yeah. So it's like not a problem whatsoever. It's not a problem. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, sort of my final project update is my role is to support you. It's for you to have the dollars and the resources that you need to address the problems in your community. And so if that looks not like harmful algal bloom work, if that looks not like ocean acidification or green crab or some of these central projects that we've sort of walked with together over the last, you know, eight years or so, connect with me, let me know, because there's always going to be small pockets of us who are really interested in one thing or another, you know, and three or five tribes can do a big push on microplastic work if that's something that's of big interest in your community. Three or five tribes can do a big push on some of this transboundary work, which, you know, three to five tribes are already doing that. So there's also always good opportunity to leverage there. So that's my role is to run IT and then <laughs> uh, get you the resources and knowledge you need to do what you need to do in your community. So um, are there any other questions or should we get talk to Morgan? Outside of all your other work, Carrie, you've been amazing at IT and thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, Morgan, can you unmute and share with us about the water quality clap? I can. Can you hear me? Really quickly, can somebody tell our young folks here at AYS what a quap is? Because you guys are hearing a bunch of acronyms, but just to give you guys an idea what a quap is. Also me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Not just you guys. Thank you. I know it's quality and plan. <laughs> what does that mean? Who's the scientist that volunteered at the Quap info? <laughs> Go ahead, Morgan. I, that was me, Ray. I was just uh, yeah. 
letting young folks know. It's a quality assurance project plan. It's something we have to write when we're doing anything from water quality sampling or any kind of scientific measures. We have to have a plan in place that allows the agency to see how you're going to do your work. So essentially that's the breakdown of a QAP. It's also fun to say, like Daniel said. It's less fun to not write per se, but edit. Um, I know sometimes we go back and forth with the EPA about now fix this, now fix this, because it's very precise. <laughs> um, our water quality testing quap for um, uh, the Talk Chinook has taken care of, um, but we're in discussions now with Ocean and Earth Environmental, um, which is, I believe, working with Lincoln and Haida and some other tribes and applying for funding to work with them. So that will be a new quap when it happens. Um, our water quality work will hopefully be greatly expanded in the next few years uh, with Ocean and Earth and via a BIA grant with the USGS. We have a stationary water gauge. I think we're going on year three with that. Um, but we're looking into um, like invertebrate uh, animal like testing in the water sampling, seeing what's in the water and maybe um, the eDNA testing. We, we don't have it everything completely planned because we're still, like I said, um, looking for funding for that. Uh, we also do have plans to do a big backhaul this year of old cars and fridges and hopefully document it. So maybe I can present on it next year. Uh, we're getting some equipment that we really needed to drain fluids out in the field without the guys crawling around on the ground in the cold weather or the wet floor. So we can drain fluids from vehicles easily and then crush the cars and fridges and um, some things like that. And then I think Daniel covered the rest. Um, we're hoping to get some action on the, the landslide and, and flooding front, like maybe get some equipment out in the field, uh, monitoring and testing and getting some data back on that. And then we can get better ideas on how to protect ourselves, how to protect the village. And uh, we're talking about hopefully you know putting more houses down but we want to make sure we don't put them down somewhere unsafe so there's kind of a lot going on in this next year no. thank you morgan i see some folks from cake that i know would love to talk about projects they have going on or not <laughs> either way i can move on Mr. Jackson. Yeah, so kindly we'll, we'll uh, chime in there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, down in Cake, we got a lot of projects going on. We uh, got ocean uh, testing been going on for two years uh, before the uh, when the uh, cruise ship stopped running. We decided to get a a, a base of when they're not running versus when they started up again. So that was one of our main priorities. We want to identify what they're dumping out there. Um, that hasn't come to a uh, conclusion yet, so we'll continue for a while. And also we got, a, a, you guys probably saw it in the news, a clam garden, our natural resource guy here, Justin, Justin McDonald, he, him and a couple other guys headed it up and uh, is it complete? Well, it's not complete yet, but um, also we got another small project on the side, uh, basically kind of related to food security is uh, um, we send up like 60 cockles to uh, Seward to a nursery up there and it Look like it's going good from our last report. Um, we're going to be getting some back just to see what they look like. And I think uh, projected numbers, when they do finally send it all back, will be about half a million. Right, Justin? Yeah, so. Um, did we have anything else going on? I know there's plenty more, but. The Indigenous Guardian Summit. Funding, yeah, we got approved for the initial uh, startup for our Digital Guardian, and also the um, what was that one, Justin? The 
Conservation District. Yeah, Tribal Conservation District. Is that going to be a local? Or are you guys joining on the regional, the Southeast regional one? And just to give you guys a heads up um, how that works, you guys can still have your local conservation district and still join the regional conservation district if you guys are looking to add on to that. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, did I miss anything else, Don? I didn't know you were back there. Got a Heron project. Oh, here. Well, it works too. A Herring transfer project, which uh, <clears throat> we just wrote for our grant. Hopefully, it gets approved. If so, it's going to be three years. We'll be transferring eggs from uh, Sitka to Cake to hopefully replenish our herring spawn closer to Cake. And so that'll be started in 2024, if everything goes right. It'll be ongoing after that, so we'll need to keep the funding going. And it's something that it's going to take about eight to 10 years of transferring in order to really have a successful uh, spawn area. So that's that's in the works as well. Who are you guys partnering with that on that? Just our, ourselves right now through, this, through the grant and we're with uh, Fish and Game as well. And Sitka tribes mainly. Sitka tribes. Thank you. So yeah. that's it. Thank you. We, got a oh, we have a question. Yeah. Fast one. Can you speak to any of the permitting that was that you had to go through to get that approved with ADF and G for moving eggs from Sitka to Cake? Because I think there'd be other communities that would be interested in pursuing that as well. We are actually taking the route of uh, using our subsistence rights and our sovereignty, practice our sovereignty and use our subsistence rights. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Great, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I got KIC, I see Jen here. And if you're not comfortable, it's fine. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so, one of the most ambitious projects we have going on is to establish our European Green Crab Early Detection and Monitoring Program. Um, this month, we're hoping to start setting traps. Um, previously, I'd been conducting molt surveys along the beaches. Um, I sent a bunch of that data to carry. Um, in addition to green crab, we've also been doing a lot of um, bacteria sampling and water quality sampling of our urban creeks. Um, so we had a beach project from 2017 to 2022 where we were testing our 12 beaches and we found elevated levels of fecal bacteria. And so as a follow-up to that project, we're testing our three urban streams for fecal bacteria. And we also collected microbial source tracking data to see what are the sources of this fecal bacteria. Um, in addition to that, um, this month, I will be going back to the UNIC to collect more water quality samples. Um, I see Meredith is back here. Um, so once every year, we travel to the UNIC to collect eDNA for the Ooligan run. Um, Meredith is gonna talk a little more about that. So this coming month, we're gonna be doing that again. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. There's probably more, but <laughs> don't wanna keep the microphone for too long. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Let's see from Wrangell, we have Kim. Good morning, my name is Kim. I'm from the Wrangell Cooperative Association. Um, this summer, we spent a lot of time kind of playing catch up. Um, we did have a turnover in our office, um, so we welcomed Alex Angerman as our new Earth Branch um, coordinator. And with that, we also welcomed a really, really cool um, intro into social media. Alex does amazing work as far as her photography, her outreach. She kind of has this idea that what's the point in doing things if nobody knows you're doing it? So she really has kind of brought us to the form of Facebook and Instagram and really helped people realize we're there and we exist. And it's been huge. It's been great for our council to see that we actually do something besides sit at a desk. We just completed our 
fifth year of our gillnet recycling, which meant 14 pallets full of gillnets that are ready to be recycled. This fall, we will be purchasing our first can baler. So our recycling program for aluminum cans should become much more streamlined and we will no longer have to use our feet to crush them, which will be wonderful for me. <laughs> Um, along with that, we will hopefully be buying a glass crusher, although I hear a glass to sand machine is much better. And then the sand can be used for um, helping our elders remove um, or keep them from slipping on ice in their driveways. So lots of good things happening in Wrangell. And hopefully, if you haven't found us on Facebook yet, you will. And you'll give us a like so you can continue to see what we're up to. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. From Kowak, I see Anne. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Anne White from uh, Kowak Cooperative. <clears throat> um, for the past year, we've been doing, our five years, we've been doing water quality testing in five areas in the clock watershed for hydrocarbons and within the five years there was uh, nothing really showing up but uh, we're starting another four-year grant and we are going to be uh, sockeye fish sampling for contaminants also um, halibut and seal and we're still doing the PSP testing and um, shellfish biomass surveying. And um, we did apply for a grant to hire a traditional food specialist and hopefully purchase a boat and, you know, and take some um, youth out and show them how to harvest. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. On your... Um... Your fish sampling, is it tissue sampling that you guys are going to be looking to do? Yes. Okay. And we're going to um, redo our quap. Yes, is that how you say it? <laughs> you can say it the fun way. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be in touch on a couple of those projects. I think that sounds very interesting. For sure. Uh, we see, I see we have someone from the native village of Eak, Ivy. Yay. Good morning. My name is Ivy Patton. I'm the environmental coordinator for the Native Village of EAC. Um, I could only speak about the programs I'm managing, but within the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources, we've accomplished a lot this last year. Um, I've been currently wearing three different hats. I'm hoping to get down to two soon. So this past year, I've been the manager for the IGAP, the Brownfield, and the NALEMP programs. This summer, we removed over 300 cubic yards of contaminated soil from a former military site. Um, all that soil was sent down to this place in Arlington, Oregon, where they accept those kind of hazardous wastes. Well, technically, it wasn't hazardous. It was just very polluted. Um, for the IGAP, I've been recently working on um, a climate change action plan. I've been writing a bunch of grants for possible marine debris funding. We've been doing the ocean acidification sampling with the Chugach Regional Resources Committee and the Ulutig Pride Shellfish Hatchery in Seward. Um, we send probably like 16 bottles of water from two different locations. One is um, just north of the Cordova Harbor, and one is about seven miles north at a place called Sheep Bay, where we have um, a newly started Mary culture program of sugar kelp. Um, and I can't, I wish I could speak more about that, but it's, it's brand new. We're just learning how to do it. With my Brownfield program, I think the newest thing we've been doing is working on something called a SCRP. Have you ever heard of that? It's a, I wrote it down because I knew I was going to be called on. <laughs> a small community emergency response plan. So it's a basically a preparedness document, how to respond to um, a disaster, whether it's natural or man-made. Um, we've been doing a lot of recycling. Every year we do electronics and household batteries recycling. And this year we're partnering with the Copper River Watershed Program to 
collect and recycle staining web, um, aluminum cans, and I think, and lead acid batteries. I think that's it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Yep. And again, thank you uh, for attending the Southeast Environmental Conference. Um, yeah. Being from Prince William Sound, it's great to have you guys come down to Southeast. And then from <clears throat> Yak Hat, I see Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Nicole. I manage our freshwater quality program in Yakutat. Um, so for freshwater quality, we're kind of waiting for um, further funding to kind of continue conducting project activities. We're closing out our big ANA grant this year. Um, but we have a couple more um, that we're just kind of waiting to hear back on. Um, in the meantime, um, we are hoping to start organizing all of the data that we've been collecting over the past three years. Um, that's more of a winter project, I think, but it's just essentially making sure everything's entered into our database um, and making sure there's no duplicate information and events. Um, I've been getting started on our USGS stream monitoring grant um, project, which is um, conducting um, stream monitoring weightable discharge activities um, and measuring temperature and kind of comparing the two very early stages. I just figured out that our aquacalc is working correctly and um, just placed our hobos. Um, we did have an issue with one of them. So there's a new one in there that I have to check next week. Um, I have a meeting set up with the DEC um, about potentially seeing if Yak Attack can join their beach program um, to measure um, like fecal matter um, and other hazardous material um, in our salt water, um, to kind of as a result of, of interest in um, testing our waters, uh, what with all the cruise ships going up in the bay. And we've all kind of had this conversation about being concerned about that. Um, so it's just seeing if Yakutat's gonna be a good fit for their program or not. Um, let's see, um, we've also been working on um, Egg Island um, treatment. So make, seeing if we can coordinate with um, the Forest Service fire squad and the Forest Service themselves and seeing if we can work on getting like some burn activities up on Egg Island to increase nesting habitat for birds um, and encourage um, subsistence of seagull eggs. Uh, so it's a lot of trying to wrangle like six different people and six different institutions for monthly meetings. It's fun. Um, we have a new OA and FIDO person, uh, Janie Jensen. Um, she's been awesome. She's uh, finally got us going on our microscope so we can start taking microscope analysis. Um, and uh, I think we were supposed to have a biomass survey this week, but I also think I saw an email saying we didn't get enough um, volunteer support for that. So we're gonna have to push that. Uh, in our composting program, I don't know a ton about this one. Um, I do know that we have 32 compost buckets out in the community um, and we are making compost. I think the next step is that it needs to cure for a year. So I think we're figuring out the logistics of that. Um, and then for our fisheries program, this summer we had um, a really awesome uh, stream restoration training um, at a site that we call Tawa Towers, um, where we input like large wood structures into fish ditches or fitches. Um, super educational. We had a couple engineers out. It was awesome. Um, I know Hava started sampling um, for coho eDNA or, um, or is getting started on. Um, and lots of ranging, uh, what with coho sport fishermen coming in, um, starting around now. And we're also prepping for our CTUC partners meeting with the Forest Service in October. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole and Bernadine. I know you just walked in. We're doing quick updates for anything you guys are working on at DIA, if you would like to. Good morning, everybody. Um, I work for DIA that's located here in Juneau and Douglas. Um, a couple of things that are kind of big for me that are coming out. Back in 2017, we started doing some sediment and uh, 
uh, the shellfish testing for heavy metals over there by the uh, uh, on Gastineau Channel there at the mine there, uh, which has been closed for like a hundred years. And then uh, we took all of that data and I petitioned the CDC to do a, a research project on it. And uh, they've been working on it for a few years now. It's uh, getting ready to be uh, finished and they're gonna be coming to Juneau in November, I believe, to uh, do a report on what they found out. Uh, the tribe was really interested in seeing how mining contaminants are affecting our food um, and also, you know, what happens in the sediment. And uh, so they looked at consumption rates and I think they even looked at Angoon consumption rates. So there's a mine over there in that area too. Uh, so that report's gonna be coming out uh, in November. And uh, we'll probably be doing some presentations on it, maybe up in Anchorage at the environmental conferences up there. And even here in town, uh, the local agencies will be wanting to meet with them. Um, and another thing that I got was a marine debris grant, uh, a sub award through the uh, doing derelict crab pot cleanup. Um, I haven't gotten that funding yet, but I did get that uh, working with ocean plastics and uh, trying to set up. DIA just recently got a boat, so we're trying to get it set up to do side scan sonar. So. Um, ordering all that equipment to get the boat set up to try and go out to Ock Bay area and do some cleanup out there. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadine. And, and thank you to the tribes. We were hoping to get presentations from you guys, but this is a really great way for you guys to put your programs out there and for our state, federal, um, all the organizations here, for a good chance for them to see what you guys are working on and you know maybe a way to share resources and and help out with some of your guys programs so thank you all to the tribes for giving a quick update on your guys's programs yep thank you so the next part of this i haven't done this in person this next part so we're going to give it a whirl here in real life um if you feel comfortable i i understand people are, are hesitant but if you feel comfortable Find someone to chat with one-on-one. -on -one. I'll give you a minute to do that. And then we'll have a two-minute conversation. And we're going to do three or four rounds of this. So find someone you want to talk to real quick, even just to touch base and get information from to contact. And you'll have two minutes to talk with them. It's very quick. It's almost like speed dating in a way. But it's just to get people talking and conversation around projects that are happening around the region. So I know we just had small updates and this is gonna get you guys moving a little bit too. So you got about a minute, find someone to chat with and then I'll start the real timer. So you're finding someone to talk to. All right, guys. I hope you guys had a productive chat this morning. Um, got to find out some information that you didn't know. Uh, share some resources. That's what this network opportunity was about. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next presenter coming up here shortly. But first, I wanted to invite Santina, Santina Gay and Jonathan Law with the EPA. Um, as many of you guys know from our, on the tribes that were on GAP, uh, Michelle Davis, our former project officer, recently retired. Uh, and now we have Jonathan Law as our new project officer and Santina um, to assist. But as you guys know, uh, we've been really good at handling our tri or handling our gap grants and we'll be here to help Jonathan out as a as our new project officer. So we'll give him a few minutes and then we'll go into our next presenters. Thank you, Ray, and good afternoon, everyone, for having us at your meeting this week. Uh, my name is Santina Gay, as Ray mentioned. I've had the privilege to work with Ray for almost three decades now, and many of you as well. Um, I work with the EPA IGAP program in Anchorage, 
Um, I am helping to train Jonathan, who, as Ray mentioned, is going to be working with Southeast Tribes on uh, the GAP grants, the General Assistance grants, and so environmental program development. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things, and I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, so the GAP program is, um, it has been expanding for the last almost three decades, and tribes are really taking the lead in terms of doing some real cutting edge work um, throughout the state of Alaska. And, and Southeast is really there up front um, in this work. So uh, one thing I'd like to mention is given the importance of the transboundary mining issues is that we do have uh, a new organization, a new tribal consortia that is going to be coming into the GAP network this year. It's the Southeast Indigenous Transboundary Mining Commission, SEITC. Um, and they have been approved for a GAP grant for, for this next, next fiscal year. Um, they, there's a few more steps uh, that Ray and I are bringing them through um, to get their EPA funding, but they'll also be looking for your support um, from the support of all Southeast tribes in, um, in, in doing their work and getting started um, in their foundational environmental program. Membership tribes, right. And so I think Guy Archibald is going, is, is around this week somewhere and um, you can touch base with him if you wanna find more about, you know, what they're planning to do in their initial years of the IGAP grant. Um, we also have another tribe coming into the program. Saxman Village will be coming into the GAP program again this year after taking a break from GAP. Um, and, you know, really what we've, it's interesting because what we've been seeing statewide is we have been seeing a little bit of attrition in the GAP program over time. And so that's something that Ray and I have been working on at the policy level, um, along with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and others to make sure that we're doing what we should be in terms of training, in terms of support providing the kind of support that tribal environmental directors in the field need as you're going through your, your jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it's interesting because even though there's a flood of infrastructure funding coming out, um, we're kind of seeing this, this uh, slope, downward slope in the GAP program. So it's just something I wanted to, to mention and, and call your attention to um, and then I'll just hand the mic over to Jonathan to introduce himself. This is um, his first environmental conference um, and his first time to Alaska. So please welcome him. Johnny Law. Hi, my name is Jonathan Law. Um, I go by Johnny, Jonathan. If you make eye contact and say a name, I'll, I'll respond more than likely. Um, so I just started with the EPA about a month and a half ago now. Um, more than likely going to be working with tribes in the Southeast. Um, super excited to be here and see, see faces and try to put some names to faces. Not very good at it, but I try. Um, I'm excited to learn. And yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, before coming to the EPA, I worked for the Quinault Indian Nation as the air quality specialist. Um, and then before that, I was able to intern for five or six years with them through the uh, youth opportunity program uh, through the tribe. Uh, and doing that, I worked doing a whole bunch of stuff that they didn't want to do. Thank, Thank you, you, Jonathan. Uh, really quickly, I think it's really great to have a, a former tribal employee working as our project officer at the EPA. Uh, it, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot to learn in the dynamics of, of federal government working with the tribe and having somebody come from a tribe to work in the federal government to work with tribes, that's a big plus. So gracious and thank you very much. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. 
I did want to, sorry, that was really loud. I did want to um, let everybody know we did set up a lunch this afternoon at 1145 at TK McGuire's, which is inside Ramada. So you guys can meet with Jonathan and exchange emails, etc. Just wanted to let you guys know. Thank you, Lindsay. And really quickly, I'd like to apologize and say thank you to Lauren for being gracious enough to give us the five minutes to let the EPA introduce themselves. And with that, I'd like to introduce Lauren Sill with the Department of Fish and Game. She'll be talking about uh, the division of subsistence, who we are, what we do, and how we work with communities in Alaska. Lauren? Good morning. Um, as Ray said, my name is Lauren Sill. I work with the Division of Subsistence. I'm excited to be here today, so thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you all. Um, the Division of Subsistence is like a social science branch of Fish and Game. We are a statewide organization. Um, we work in communities all over. I am based in Southeast out of the Douglas office. Um, my current position actually is research, uh, the regional program manager, so I work on all the research that we do south of the Alaska range, but up until about last, well, a few months ago, um, I was the lead researcher for Southeast region, um, which I had done for a little over 10 years. Um, so, so I'd like to take this opportunity to say that we are looking for a new lead researcher for a Southeast. So if you guys know anybody, the recruitment position is open right now, and we're hoping to get a lot of good applicants for that position. Um, I'm particularly excited to be here to talk today because I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for collaboration for both like doing new research and for the data we have. We've been around for 40 years. We have a pretty extensive um, database of harvest information, use information sharing. And I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities for us. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to share a little bit about what we do um, and how we try to work with communities. I don't know. Oh, nope, it's not. Yeah, look at that. All right. So just a little bit about the division. Um, we've been around since 1978. Uh, we are in, sta in, in Alaska statute. We are, our mission is laid out, which is basically to do research, original research, um, data collection, data compilation, as well as reporting of that data, education and outreach. Um, we've been trying, but most of our outreach so far has been like reports, which are not that exciting. So we've been trying to find new and novel ways to, to um, report on, on what we're doing through posters, um, videos, story maps, those kind of things. And then we are an applied anthropology division. So one of the most important things that we do is not just collect the data, but to actually apply the data um, in the real world to apply our study findings. Uh, so a lot of our research projects come from those statutory duties of, of fulfilling those duties, but they also come from communities. That's another important part of the data that we collect. Uh, going into things like comprehensive plans or you know concerns about development, local development, um, concerns about resource depletion, any number of things. Um, we try to work with communities to be able to collect data to answer those questions. A lot of our funding, um, we do get funding through the state, but a lot of our funding for actual research projects comes through competitive grants. And so sometimes our research has a lot to do with what people are willing to fund. Okay, so a little bit more about each of those uh, statutory duties that we have. Um, for research, for research and data compilation, we have a variety of types of research projects. One of our main ones are baseline harvest studies, which is uh, uh, household surveys about the use and harvest of, of all sorts of resources. Um, we also do harvest monitoring, which is like year-to-year -year tracking of uh, harvest of a particular fishery or um, hunt, I suppose. We also do local and traditional knowledge or traditional ecological research, um, a lot of interviews and documenting um, LTK through interviews with uh, elders, active subsistence harvesters, knowledgeable people in communities. And we also do special topic research, which is largely informed by community, particular community needs. The goal of all of this kind of research is a more holistic understanding of a community's mixed economy and ways of life. Um, it's more than just harvest numbers that come through permits and wildlife, um, you know, through through subsistence salmon permits or shrimp permits or um, deer tags, anything like that. And most of our projects are partnerships. 
with communities because really we couldn't do any of this work if we didn't have the involvement and participation of communities. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. Okay, I wanna talk briefly, not in any great detail, but just kind of what our methods tend to be. Um, there are three main methods that we use to collect data. One is household harvest surveys, and these are, I think, are probably our bread and butter of, this is where we go door to door in a community and sit down with the active harvesters or the heads of households and talk about the previous years, hunting, fishing, berry picking, seaweed, um, bird hunting, pretty much everything, any sort of wild food um, activity we, we talk about. Um, other, we do interviews, key respondent interviews, and these are much more, um, much more wide ranging um, and broad where we cover a lot of topics where it's not just about harvest and it's not just about the previous year, but it's kind of about life in the community, about subsistence, about trends and changes and patterns. Um, and for, you know, and we realize on, on what the person we're speaking to is particularly knowledgeable about. And then we also do participant observation, which is basically where we get to go fishing or hunting or berry picking with um, community members. And it's useful, it's really, it's a, it's a great, one of our methods because you can hear all sorts of things and, and have an understanding from talking with people about something, but it's very different than actually getting out and getting to do it with someone. Okay, so working with communities. Um, as I said, it's a big part of what we do. Um, for every project that we, that we have, we don't move forward on any of it until we have community approval to do the research in the community. Um, at some, we usually we work with, with tribal governments, city governments, um, there's no organized government, we work with community organizations, kind of whatever, whatever is available in the community to speak with. Uh, at some point during the beginning of the project, we do a community scoping meeting um, where we try to get broad community um, involvement to come to a meeting and just hear about like what the project is, why we're doing it, um, what we're asking community members to do, what's gonna happen with the data once we've collected it. Uh, and then once, even though we get approval to come to the community and to do research, all of the research itself is voluntary. So before, when we knock on someone's door to ask them to do a survey, we explain what the survey is and ask them to participate. And they can say no, and we'll walk away and we'll go to someone else's house. Um, and there's no, it's a completely voluntary thing. And even once someone does agree to participate, that's uh, all the information that we collect is anonymous and it's confidential. Once we've done all of the research and we've gone through and analyzed the data and we have draft results, we come back to a community, present the, um, information and that's an opportunity for people to tell us what we misunderstood, what we um, just missed completely, maybe help us interpret some patterns that are emerged through the data analysis. And then the report, once all the data is done and we've reviewed it, it goes into, we write a technical paper and uh, the harvest data, the, raw, the, you know, the, the community level harvest data is available to communities. And throughout all of this, throughout all of our projects, um, one part of what we is really valuable to us is we hire local researchers to help us in communities um, and they're really invaluable. I, I can think of many of our projects that just wouldn't have succeeded if we hadn't had local researchers helping us um, for a number of reasons. Um, so it's great for, for us and hopefully it also uh, pays back a little bit to, to the community members because they get paid for helping and for working on surveys with us and provide some skills. You know, we use iPads and ArcGIS field collector maps um, to collect spatial data and we have uh, you know, skills in interviewing and survey collection, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so a little more detail about harvest surveys. Um, they are, like I said, they're probably our primary data collection method or tool. Um, we can do surveys about single species, just about salmon or just about crab or, you know, something that's of particular interest. We can also do comprehensives where I mentioned before we talk about everything. Um, and not only harvest, but we also ask about demographics and economics, about resource assessment, um, about food security, about changes over time. And they provide, those comprehensive surveys really provide a much broader context than just um, harvest, harvest numbers, right? We hear about sharing and we hear about um, the time of year they go and the different methods used to, to harvest and why those methods are used. And sometimes it goes into processing. Um, Ideally, we also, we talk about um, search areas, we document where people are, are searching and harvesting for um, resources. And ideally we do these surveys like every 10 years just to kind of get an updated baseline. That's not what's happened in Southeast, um, largely because of funding. So there are a bunch of communities that, well, there are several communities that we were, that had a harvest survey done in the late 1980s and nothing since then. So that data is super old, um, places like Gustavus where the community has changed dramatically since 1987, but we don't have any um, there's really no new information about that. 
And then there are a whole lot of communities that haven't been updated since the 1990s. So that's something that we were working on, looking for funding and trying to, trying to survey more communities and collect uh, more recent data. So the next couple of slides are just gonna be sort of uh, um, examples of what kind of, of what we can do with the information, the data that we collect, the kind of figures that we pr um, create. So this one is wild food harvest in Alaska. Um, it's and for 2017, so it's a little bit dated, but on the left-hand side, that axis is pounds of usable weight of resources per person, and along the bottom are the different regions. So it starts on the left with um, urban Alaska, so Anchorage, Matsu, Kenai area, Valdez, Fairbanks, Juneau, Ketchikan. Um, and they are the lowest per capita harvest. You know, there are people who hunt and there are people who don't hunt. So once you spread out the harvest over that large population of urban um, Alaskans, it's a relatively low, it's about 20 pounds per person. And then as you move down the axis, it gets significantly higher and higher per capita pounds until you get to the Arctic region, which on average has about 400 pounds of wild resources harvested per person. Um, rural, south, rural Southeast is the fourth one over. And on average in 2017, it was like 189 pounds per person. That obviously is very, um, it's variable depending on what community you're in. And, any, and, and for any given year, honestly, too, it can change. But what's interesting about this besides seeing the differences between the regions and harvest is it shows the composition of harvest. Uh, so the blue bars on the bottom are the, the weight of salmon harvest. The red bars are the um, non-salmon fish, other kinds of fish, halibut and hooligan, dolly varden, pike. Um, the green bars are shellfish, purple is large land mammal or land mammals, blue is marine mammals, then the orange is birds and eggs, and the very top are the wild plants and berries and seaweed. Um, so none of it's like super surprising, but it is still interesting to see, you know, for, for Southeast, you look at that bar chart and the, you know, three quarters of the harvest is made up of the marine resources of salmon, other fish and shellfish. And you move a little further and you go somewhere like the interior where salmon's still super important. You still have the Yukon and Kuskokwim, you know, providing salmon sources, but large land mammals, you know, caribou and moose are, are much more important or contribute a much greater percentage of the overall harvest. And then you get somewhere like the Arctic region where there aren't a whole lot of fish. Um, and marine mammals are, you know, the most important part of, or that make up the majority of the weight of, of the harvest in that area. Okay, so this is another, um, another way to look at some of the data that we collect. And this is about participation, household participation and harvesting and, pro and harvesting resources. So the blue bars are the percent of households using a resource. The orange, the light orange bars are the numbers who are fishing, hunting, gathering, and then the dark orange are the ones who have actually harvested something. Um, along the bottom are the different resource categories that we talk about. So I think this is interesting for a number of reasons. One, it shows just how important resources are in households. You know, the over 90% of households in Yakutat in 2015 used resources of some sort, used wild resources of some sort. Um, but it also, this starts to get at the importance of sharing in communities. You know, you look at the blue bars and they are higher across the, across the graph than the orange bars, meaning that there are a lot more households using a resource than are actually harvesting them. And some things, you know, like large land mammals, which in Yakutat is basically moose, right, where you have maybe only a quarter of the community is harvesting moose, but that moose moves throughout the community so that almost every household there um, ends up using moose. And that's true for... Um, for most for resources, bring you can see it, birds and eggs, marine invertebrates, marine mammals. Okay, so here's a, another one. Like I said, we try to do these surveys periodically over the years. Um, and so one of the things that we can do is we can look back at past surveys and look at the differences between the between the survey years. And this is somewhat limited because each of these these harvest surveys just talk about one year in time. So it could be a very weird year. You know, we've been places where there was a giant flood that prevented everybody from moose hunting. And so there was no moose harvest that year. So, you know, there's, there's, it's just one year. It's not, it's not necessarily trends, but we do have other things that we can look at when we're, when we're analyzing this data to look at, you know, maybe subsistence salmon permits and see what the trends of those are saying. Are they also increasing or decreasing or um, deer tickets, things like that to try to fill in the blanks between some of the years. Um, but, even, even with that, you know, you can still kind of look at the differences between years and see like in Kloak at least, it looks like that's a pretty upward trend towards harvesting more, but you can also look at the composition of the harvest and see that it stays pretty similar from year to year. You know, salmon and non-salmon are important. 
um, large land mammals, the marine mammals fluctuates, you know, how much of a overall, how much it, it contributes, and then plants seem to, you know, more vegetation hardly. Um, and then, you know, so Kulak, we haven't been, there's not been a survey in Kulak since 1997, but we have done some other communities in Southeast in the last 10 years or so. And it's been really interesting to look at the composition because in general, the communities we've been to, the, you know, the portion of the harvest coming from salmon has been decreasing, whereas the portion from non-salmon fish, especially halibut, has been increasing, you know, I think with the introduction of the uh, shark cars and the federal subsistence. And then things like shellfish, you know, have definitely decreased and certainly you can see it in clams. Um, and so looking at harvest composition and our interviews and the survey comments and all that kind of helps paint a whole picture of, um, of communities of changes in salmon resource abundance, changes in sea otters and fuel prices, all those things that go into um, creating what, what happens in any particular year. Okay, so one of the other things that we collect is information on where people are searching for resources, um, not necessarily like where did you get your exact, but where were you moose hunting or where were you deer hunting? Um, and so this is the resource, this is for Yakutat again in 2015. And as you can see, it's like, it's very generalized areas of search, you know, and it's all at a community level. We're not saying where any particular household went and did um, any, any act, harvesting activities. And we don't publish any parts where it was less than three households went to that area. So, you know, if there's just one guy that went one place, it doesn't show up on these maps. Um, and I think this is another one where we can look at over time, you know, every time we do one of these surveys, we have these maps to look at. And one of the things that we've noticed a lot recently um, for the kind of all over the state, but um, here in Southeast too, is that the area that people are harvesting or searching for, for resources is shrinking and becoming much more localized, um, likely because of, you know, change like increased fuel prices, changes in, you know, commercial salmon participation, uh, those sort of things. But Okay, so moving on from the harvest surveys, the quantitative data that we collect to the more qualitative data, um, we're gonna talk about our ethnographic projects. And ethnography generally, um, it's a data collection method, qualitative data collection method of observations, interviews, um, from which you draw conclusions about how societies and individuals function. Often, um, they are, well, they can be a standalone project. You know, we've done we've done projects on the Mulchatna caribou herd. We're talking to harvesters over their lifetime, doing map biographies, interviews. You know, the entire project is just qualitative data information uh, collection. But often it's, a, it's part of a harvest survey. You know, we'll do harvest surveys and we'll do interviews along with it to try to better understand that one year of quantitative data to put in a much broader context of the whole community and changes in the recent past and what's happening um, now. And so these are just some of the examples of types of projects we've done in the past that are more ethnographic in nature, like, uh, um, you know, how families and family groups organize to harvest and process resources, um, what, tr you know, traditional hunting practices and technologies, um, place name research, how historic methods of processing compare to contemporary methods, how resources move throughout a community um, and then beyond. And so I mentioned that we are an applied division. So one of the um, more important things we do is to try to apply the study findings that we have. Um, as I said, for this is basically like what happens to all the data once we've collected it. And at like its most basic level, the household level data, the surveys, all of that, the surveys themselves get destroyed, the household level data gets stored in a secure database and it doesn't get shared. Um, so everything that from the moment after we collect the data, all the information is at a community level, um, talking about the whole, you know, expanded out to talk about the whole community. Um, mainly we have the, the two main data sources that, that we produce are technical papers um, and the community subsistence information system, which is an online database. And technical papers are, they're full of charts and figures and analysis. They're very long. They're not always that exciting. There's a lot of information in them. Um, but we also produce these summaries, which are four page, usually about four pages, they're in color, and they kind of just go all over the highlights with, you know, links to get to the full, full technical paper if someone's interested in it. Um, so, you know, the, the data, the way that we use the data, like, it, you know, the data becomes, you know, the community can use the data for however it can support the, the goals that the community has. The way that the division uses the data often, you know, is, is things that goes into the regulatory process and to boards. We get asked a lot to comment on development projects or mariculture. And so this information goes to making sure that if someone's proposing to develop, you know, uh, 
somewhere that there is, we have documented uses of subsistence resources that we're able to, to put that onto the record and make sure that is taken into account when they're looking at permitting. Um, also, the data goes towards documenting the importance of subsistence activities and trying to help understand the connections between resource populations and subsistence use patterns, which helps us when we're trying to talk to the boards about commenting on proposals or um, answering their questions. Um, this, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because there's a lot on that slide and I know you probably can't see a whole lot of it, but this is the Community Subsistence Information System. Um, and if you go, the link to it is at the bottom. If you go to it, it won't look quite like this now because this is our new interface because our old interface, if you tried to use it, it's challenging um, at the best of times. This one we're hoping is more user-friendly um, and more intuitive than, than what we currently have going on. Uh, but basically, in the CSIS, you know, you can collect, you can choose to look at any community, any region, any resource, and get all the data that we have at the community level for that. So on this slide, if you can see it, I've chosen Sitka. And it has the community list, and it says that, you know, we we did a survey in Sitka in 2013. It is a representative year because it was a comprehensive survey. I think it's a little information, you know, that we talked to 212 households. There were 2,965 2 households in the community. And you can scroll through that and look at all the different surveys that we have done in Sitka over the years. Um, and then there's an option and a link to download all the data. So then you're ended up with this very large Excel sheet where you can produce your own tables and figures um, and compare harvests and use and sharing um, for all resources over the years. And if anyone um, finds themselves on the CSIS or is curious about it, please feel free to give me a call and I can help talk through um, some of the headings don't make a lot of sense. It's a it's definitely a work in progress, but it's a it's a probably there's no other database like that, I don't think anywhere in the world that has that much subsistence harvest data um, in it across the state. Um, so I guess the final thing to talk about is a lot of this, as I said, a lot of this data ends up um, being used at state regulatory meetings. And so I just want to put in a little plug for, for board meetings. Um, there, the, this is just for state. There is also the federal side of the um, regional advisory councils and the federal subsistence board, which we also participate in. But we're particularly involved in the state board of fisheries and board of game. And they meet every three years um, based on regions. So Southeast gets uh, every three years. They just had a meeting um, last year, I think in Anchorage because of COVID. But the next meeting is going to be January 28th in Ketchikan, which means that their proposals should be, um, you have to submit proposals by next April. And then the Southeast Board of Game also just met earlier this year in Ketchikan. So they'll be meeting again, probably in January of 2026, but they have not set the date or the, or the location for it yet. But those proposals would be due in May of 2025. Um, and so a lot of the, the harvest data that we have and the information that we've collected through the years, you know, can go into the board process at multiple levels. Like it can inform proposals that are being put into the board for someone to consider. Um, we definitely use it when we're commenting as staff on proposals that are gonna go to the board. Uh, it also can get used during public comment period, oral and written comments, um, and as we answer questions before the boards. And I think that's, yeah, that's all. So thank you very much for listening to me talk today. If you have any questions, I would love to hear them. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for that. Um, since the uh, last century, <laughs> I've been involved with uh, duking it out with the state of Alaska um, from the village of Huna regarding the clear cut logging around us and finding out that we don't have a voice in the state. You know, as long as the state of Alaska doesn't formally recognize the 230 federal, federally recognized tribes in this state, there's huge gaps. And your studies show it. Back in that, the time I'm talking, I was part of um, collecting data for the state uh, subsistence use. And um, that's a long time ago. So we're talking a whole different world now where most of us from Huna now live in Juneau and other places. And those ones that you referred to about being interviewed uh, elders, they're gone now. So we need a new plan here. and. You kind of glossed over the uh, Federal Subsistence Board Regional Advisory Councils, and this is an important connection because the state of Alaska, ADF and G, dual manages subsistence across Alaska. 
but instead of recognizing the federally recognized tribes, you gloss over that and, and call the subsistence users federally authorized people to gather subsistence. So we need to put our faces back with the state of Alaska and to the, the, these board meetings with Federal Subsistence Board because it, folks are key players in it. And every village in Southeast Alaska, Tlingit, Haida, Simsian should be at the table at CRAC coming up with this information that you brought forward to us. This is stuff we need to know with the CRAC because right now, the other part of the story not being talked about with statistics is the commercial sports harvests, which we watch by the tons coming out of our homelands and our water. And, the, and this, why isn't, why don't we see a comparison here? Because we get what, six salmon. Then we gotta cut that little fin off. If we don't cut that little fin off, guess what? We go to court. So I'll tell you, I'm pretty familiar with the state court standing there without fit, without any legal representation. And we do win because the state doesn't know what to do with us. They don't know how to properly deal with our hunting and fishing and gathering in the villages because you've taken our authority away in the mines. But we're still here. All this research, we can help you with it. What about the research from the universities, Anchorage and um, other universities, UAS, across Alaska, there is, there is really good studies about our traditional fisheries throughout time that really should be taught to our young people right now. These ones sitting right here, they should already know about these. So there's gaps, let's, let's fix these gaps. Start with showing up at the regional advisory councils and, and let us talk because that's our only access to you as villages. I'm telling you, Southeast, we're dangling around in the breeze here. Thank you, I didn't, I, I, I've only had coffee this morning, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, hi, thank you for taking the time um, to present. And I'm gonna ask you this question because you're the face here, but it's really two questions actually for the larger um, department. But my first question is if you're willing to clarify how this research you're collecting is benefiting the communities that you're drawing from beyond compensation for their time and exposure to tools like GIS. Um, it feels so generous that these families are willing to offer this traditional knowledge. Um, and I'm curious how you begin to even um, reciprocate for that. And my second question um, is, if the tribes whose traditional homelands you're collecting information from have any sovereignty over the data that's collected, um, including it belonging to them or having the right um, for it to not be public information. Okay, so yeah. Okay. The, um, to your first question, it is, it's incredibly generous of everyone of the amount of time that they spend talking to us and answering our questions, whether it's the survey or whether it's interviews. Um, and we're very cognizant of that when we're, ah, there we go, when we're there. Um, and how it benefits communities, it can vary. There are times where I feel like, well, we did all this survey, we did all this research, and we haven't done anything with it. I don't, you know, communities are, are able to do things. I know some communities have looked at, looking into food security, in particular, looking at the results and trying to figure, you know, trying to, to create internal plans that we have, you know, that we're not, we're not part of that. Um, but where we have used it is things like for Board of Fisheries comes to mind, you know, a few years ago, there were a lot of proposals trying to close small areas outside of communities to um, commercial crabbers. 
And so we were able, the, the data that communities had given us recently, it happened that we had done surveys and that we had new data saying, you know, that yes, Dungeness crab is super important to all these communities and the harvest area really is just right here in front of their community. They don't go elsewhere. And not all communities, the board did not close areas for everybody, but there were several communities that using that data, the board closed to commercial crabbers. So hopefully that does go back into to helping protect subsistence resources for those communities, you know, for, for future. So I think those are sort of the ways that we try. And I think it's something that we, we think about a lot and try to figure out how to do better because, you know, there's room for growth for sure. Um, and then your second question about sovereignty. Uh, for when we're starting the projects and we have public funding to do it, then we don't have, it's it's public data. Like we do do community review and certainly like when it comes to mapping, if there are places that are really sensitive, you know, we'll, we'll leave them off of a map. Um, but it is at that community level, it, it becomes public data because we are a public agency with public funds and we don't have a lot of choice in the matter for that. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know we're, but there may be more questions, but um, you see Lauren's contact information there. Uh, feel free to reach out to her or reach out to us if you have any further questions or comments. Again, we'll be sure to share all this information uh, post-conference or post-forum. Um, but thank you, Lauren. Um, really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. All right. Um, so I think next we have the um, Amy and Wes. And they are with the NOAA. Um, so we'll get your information pulled up here. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? God gave me a gentle voice and it doesn't carry very far, so I'm gonna hold the mic close. I'm Emily Wilson. I work for NOAA Fisheries. I'm the new regional tribal coordinator. I was just hired on actually about eight months ago. It took us a little over a decade to get a tribal liaison. So woo, we've got the funding and we're moving forward with our tribal relations program. With me today is Wes Larson. He's from our Alaska Fishery Science Center. We're gonna switch it up a little bit this morning and I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about collaborative opportunities with NOAA and our tribes. And then Wes is gonna come up and introduce himself and talk about the environmental DNA and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna go over equity and environmental justice strategy. So thank you so much for the Central Council, Clinkett Haida for hosting us for this invitation today. Gunishish, we're really thrilled to be with you. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about NOAA Fisheries. Some of you think we've had in the past some um, confusion over wh who we're a part of. We're actually the part of the Department of Commerce. So we are not with DOI, Department of Interior, we're with Commerce. So Commerce is the one that activates all the economy, the um, community, oppor job opportunities, everything that runs the economy. Think about it as that economic development. And there are 12 different bureaus under the Department of Commerce and I'm from the NOAA Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as well as my colleague Russ. We have 40 different sub bureaus that are under NOAA. And here are six that you might be familiar with. The Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, NOAA Satellite, National Marine Fishery Service, which I'm from today and also Wes, my colleague, the National Ocean Service, National Weather Service and Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. And then under NIMS or the National Marine Fishery Service, which is synonymous with NOAA Fisheries. We have five different regions. So you're most familiar with our Alaska region up here in Alaska, but we also have the West Coast region, the Greater Atlantic region, we have our Southeast region and our Pacific Islands region. And so under each of these different five regions, there's one regional office and there's at least one science center that supports that office. So here we have the Alaska Regional Office, which I work for, which is our policy and management um, operations. And then Wes is with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in which we do our research that then supports all of our decision making. Yeah. 
Give me a second. I'm trying to advance our slide here. It was working just a second ago. All righty. We'll see if we can troubleshoot here. Thank you so much. Is that why it looks like a duplicate? All right. Hold fast, folks. We're giving you a little breather here while we figure it out. Thank you. All righty, here we go. A restart. Perfect. Would you like me to try to advance now? Okay. All right, we just went over the department and all of the different regions. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Next slide, please. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate your help. All right, so I'm going to talk about, give you a snapshot of the Alaska region. We have four different programs that are listed at the top here. So we have our aquaculture program that goes over mariculture, does the permitting, works with you on different um, clam gardens. We heard about clam gardens today and yesterday. We have our Arctic program um, led by Kaya Bricks, and she's with our University of Alaska. We have our communications program there we, where we um, do our web stories. We get our great, all the work, talk to the press, all the wonderful things that we do and get that out. Um, also working in social media. And we just started our tribal relations program. And it's me, myself, and I. Uh, I'm the only one within that. But I do have staff within each of the different divisions to help support me in that. And we have six different divisions within our Alaska region. We have our information services that keep us up and running, all those great IT folks that make us look good and help us get connected with everyone. We have our operations and management. And in that, we have our federal budget, but we also have all of our grant funding that's available. And I'll share a little bit about that with you today that for the grant funding for tribes. And then we have our protected resource uh, division, which is um, talking about marine mammals, all of our co-management plans that we have with many of our tribal partners, particularly up north. And then we have our sustainable fisheries division, and that's with all of our fishery actions. And we work very closely with our North Pacific Fisheries Management Council on those actions. And then Habitat Conservation Program is where we go out. We're doing fish passage projects. We're working on hydropower projects with many of you. And then finally, we have our restricted access management. We have Jerry Stoll here with us today. She works in our um, RAM department, and that's with all of our permitting. Next slide, Carrie. Thank you. And here's our Alaska Fisheries Science Center. There's a lot of research that's being done, and Wes will talk a little bit more about this um, next up. But we have our fish and crab stock assessments and surveys. We have our genetics research. We have our bycatch reduction research. There's lots of fishery monitoring that's going on out there off our coast. We have our marine mammal surveys, um, ecosystem monitoring, especially our Bering Sea model. We've got socioeconomic research and our ecosystem surveys as well, um, along with our process studies that we have and our climate modeling for fisheries. Any one of these topics could be a talk in and of itself or a presentation in and of itself. Wes is going to go over some eDNA genetics research with us today. Next slide, Carrie. And so now I want to transition into a few opportunities. I have two funding opportunities I want to share with you and then our aquaculture opportunity areas. Go ahead, Carrie. So the first funding opportunity I want to share with you is about habitat restoration. It's actually um, focused on fish passage upgrades. So if you have projects, there's 175 million now. It's unprecedented, the funding that we're getting right now for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and our Inflation Reduction Act. This is where those fundings are coming from. And they'll support any projects to reopen those migratory pathways for fish and to help restore healthy habitat. And the closing date for that is October 16th. If you have any information or want more information on that, please reach out to me or reach out to the contact there at the bottom of the screen, Erica Amon. She'll be able to help you 
And then we have a grant, nearly 85 million in funding just for tribal projects. And this is really exciting, folks. So it's also to improve fish passage, but it's to build tribal capacity. So if you're looking to build your teams out, you're looking to hire more staff, this is where we have 85 million available for you. So this is for US federally recognized tribes. It's also for Alaska Native tribes, our native corporations, and Alaska tribal organizations. So just implementing that fish passage work and building tribal organizational capacity is really important for food security. So the closing date on that is November 8th. I left this webinar up here because we just recently had one last week just for our tribes. So you could get on with us, we could talk about these funding opportunities, walk through some of the applications and answer your questions. So if you are interested, let me know. We'll set up another one so we can go through this and walk through the process with you together. And there's more information on the link on the slide as well. Next slide. The next one has to do with transformational habitat restoration, and this is our coastal resiliency grants. This is to make you strong and resilient when we have flooding events, when we have weather events and storms and other things. There, it, there's 240 million available for habitat restoration and coastal resilience for those folks that have a plan in place or are looking to expand that or put a plan together. The closing date for that is mid-November, so right around November 17th. And coming soon, we'll have a pot of money, about $10 million just for tribes. And I encourage you to apply for this, for those habitat restoration and resiliency uh, grants as well. And if you want to learn more or have more information regarding grant opportunities that pop up through NOAA, we, our Office of Habitat Conservation does have a link down here to sign up for our newsletter. So feel free to take a look at that click on that link, sign up for our newsletter if you want more funding opportunities in the future as well. And again, our NOAA contact for that is Erica Amon. Next slide. And finally, I wanna talk about our aquaculture opportunity areas in Alaska. NOAA Fisheries has been granted the approval to go to Alaska this year and identify those AOAs. Right now they're working in California with the California tribes. They're a little bit ahead of us. They've been able to work on that project on the last two years. So we're trying to get our feet under us in Alaska and talk to our counterparts on the West Coast to um, figure out how we wanna move forward and work with our tribal partners on this. This is really important. So what is an aquaculture opportunity area? Well, those are those areas that are going to provide that food security. We're gonna expand those economic opportunities in coastal and rural areas and increase our nation's food security for seafood. And we use the best available science as we move forward, coupled with indigenous knowledge. So for the federal government, this is huge people, listen carefully. Just this year, through our government to government presidential memo, we have incorporated indigenous knowledge as best available science. It counts, it's there. And so we, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that deserves applause. Um, so the best available science will be that indigenous knowledge and coupled with Western science so that we can look at the appropriate spaces in order to develop these areas so that there are no conflicts. We're gonna look at shipping lanes, we're gonna look at fishing areas, subsistence areas, um, activities that might be occurring out there that are important to you and also the military so that when we establish these areas, we have those conversations with you. We figure out where are those best spots to put mariculture, aquaculture, et cetera. So this is a multi-year planning process. These are not pre-permitted sites. So you still have to get a permit from the state and you will still have to get a permit from the, our federal agency, but we can work with you on this. And these aquatic farms can be sited both in and outside of the AOA. So those farms don't necessarily have to be part of the aquaculture opportunity area, but we sure wanna work with you to make sure that we establish the right ones in the right locations. And then these will support seaweed, shellfish, and other invertebrates. So we do not have fish included in our aquaculture opportunity areas. And the size, location, and the farm type will be determined by interactions with you, our tribal partners, and public input. All right, Carrie, next up. 
So now I'm going to turn it over. Well, first I'll uh, mention our regional contacts. So again, if you have any questions about the funding opportunities or the AOAs, feel free to reach out to myself. But we also have Erica Amon, who is in charge of a lot of our grant funding for tribes. And we have Alicia Bishop, who is in charge of our aquaculture program here in our regional office. So at this time, I'm going to invite Wes Larson to come up and share with you a little bit about the Alaska Fisheries Science Center Environmental DNA. All right. Thanks, Amy Lee. And thanks so much for having me today. I uh, really appreciate the invite here. Uh, my name is Wes Larson. I work uh, at the lab out the road there uh, at Lena Point. So, um, yeah, hopefully if you guys have been out there and wonder what's going on, this will um, this will help a little bit. So before I get into our stuff, um, just a little bit about our lab. So we're one division in the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. There's a good chunk of it down in Seattle and then some more people in Kodiak. Um, and here we focus on genetics, uh, stock assessment, and then ecosystem monitoring and uh, chemistry. And a lot of our work is in like the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska, but we do have quite a bit of Southeast work as well. Um, and we're always looking to kind of do more things uh, locally. So yeah, hopefully there's some opportunities to collaborate here. It'd be really, um, really neat. And so, yeah, I'm gonna talk about environmental DNA. I think it's a really neat tool um, to be able to monitor kind of communities and um, ecosystems uh, relatively um, efficiently. So kind of a way to maybe like increase, you know, the power for monitoring, take some samples and, and learn a whole bunch instead of like having to go out there and set a bunch of nets and things like that. So yeah, um, okay, next slide is good. Okay, so uh, like I said, here's our lab out the road. Uh, it's your local genetics lab. And so hopefully we can be helpful for you guys uh, in the future here. Uh, yeah, next slide's good. Okay, so um, eDNA, the basics of it are essentially, you can go out there, take a water sample, filter it, and then figure out uh, what organism was there uh, in, near the water sample. So uh, first off, DNA is shed into the, um, in the water, soil, and air. So this is an example of a, of a, a cod here, um, shedding DNA. And then, uh, next slide, skin. And then the fish moves away, the DNA stays, and then we can go out there and sample the water. Uh, next slide. Yeah, okay, so here's kind of some basics of it. This is just uh, kind of an early proof of concept, which is uh, published over 10 years ago now, which is kind of crazy. But essentially, you take some water, uh, you do a bunch of DNA preps and things like that. And oh, it's nice to see Meredith in the audience. Meredith uh, knows a lot about eDNA. She uh, she worked with us for a uh, couple of years, a year, um, and before going to her PhD. So she's also a really great contact for, for eDNA stuff as well. Um, but basically, we uh, go out there, sample water, and then we do some things in the lab to uh, sequence the DNA, and then we can figure out uh, what the species composition is uh, in a given area. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so here's just a little bit more on the actual kind of like a little more details on the collection. So yeah, we have like water bottles. There's various ways to collect um, the actual water, but it's usually about like a liter or a few samples of a liter. And then we uh, vacuum filter it uh, to trap the DNA on a filter and then place the filter in a tube with ethanol. And uh, when I say we, uh, this part is is pretty feasible to do. It's um, uh, totally reasonable to do it in the field to do all this filtering in the field. And if you want, if if anyone wanted to do eDNA, um, that would be the part that we kind of teach you guys how to do. And um, it's totally feasible to do uh, on location. Uh, next slide, skin. Okay, so here's um, kind of our focal areas uh, of eDNA at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and so. Um, a few things we're trying to do are, are, are largely focused on like uh, some of our big surveys for assessing like pollock and and peacock and rockfish and things like that in the Gulf of Alaska. So extending survey range, characterizing areas where uh, it's hard to fish because it's so rocky, uh, assessing rapidly changing um, Arctic communities, and then kind of just understanding how eDNA works. That's the ecology of eDNA. So like how does it spread through the water? How often can we how long can we detect something and how far away? Um, and things like that. Okay, next slide, Skin. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time on um, a local proof of concept, which was one of our first eDNA study that I did when um, when I got here uh, about three and a half years ago. And so this was like peak COVID or just, it was like September, 2020. And we were trying to figure out something we could do 
uh, to show how eDNA works uh, without like a huge operation and a bunch of COVID paperwork and stuff like that. So um, we decided that we would survey uh, some of our local sites around Juno and try and understand if we could figure out um, and if there's differences in different habitats uh, that we could find with eDNA uh, in the fish community. So we went out, we sampled uh, three sand, three rock, um, and three eelgrass sites uh, with the goal of trying to understand differences in fish, communi fish communities among habitats um, according to eDNA. And if you guys are um, Juno residents here, those sites will probably be pretty familiar. familiar. So it was uh, like Auk Rec Auk Recreation Area, um, Eagle Beach, and and right next to there, and then out the road a little bit more, Bridget, Echo, and then right at the end of the road, Cascade there. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so this is uh, kind of a, a typical way to look at the raw data of, of eDNA. And so um, on the bottom is the site and on the um, the vertical axis on the, um, on the left there is uh, the species. And the species are kind of lumped into larger than single species groups because that's uh, how much resolution we can get uh, with this particular eDNA um, detection thing. But you'll see some, let's see if I can point at some some um, kind of common species here. So things like these are greenling. Um, let's see, where are these are salmon, herring. Uh, these are flatfish, but not halibut, like your yellowfin sole and things like that. Uh, sculpin, cod. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, they're stable fish. And so basically you can see what was detected at, um, at what different sites. And things like, there's some things that are pretty much present in like almost every single sample. So you're talking about salmon, herring, flatfish. But interestingly here, and I'll get this into, uh, into this a little bit more, flatfish you can see are like pretty much in every single eelgrass sample, pretty much in every single sand sample, but in quite a few less rock samples, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like flatfish, yellowfin sole, starry flounder, they live in sand. So this was kind of a, a nice way to see that it was detecting some of those differences that we know to be uh, true. Okay, next slide, Skin. Okay, so here we go. Here's kind of a, um, uh, a good way to say this. So sand-oriented fish like flatfish and staghorn sculpin were found less in the rock environments. Uh, next slide. And then rock-oriented fish like uh, greenlings were found more in rock. So uh, it does look like uh, the eDNA is actually picking up, you know, some ecological differences that we sort of know to be uh, know to be true. Uh, go ahead, next slide. And here's a here's kind of an interesting uh, sort of example of something that was a little bit more cryptic, meaning like a little bit harder to detect um, that we found that we thought was kind of neat. So we saw that these three different types of um, sort of small bait fish. Uh, showed up more in sand environments on high tide uh, than they did in, in other areas. So like stickleback, um, herring, and like, smelts. Um, and so basically what we think is that these fish are kind of pushing up um, towards the beach at high tide, maybe for like cover, maybe for food, something like that. But it's, it's something that you actually wouldn't have detected uh, probably another way because uh, typically, the way that we survey nearshore environments is is with beach staining, and so that's one a lot of work, and two, you do it at low tide because it generally maximizes the um, your catches. But this is something that you would have never seen um, if you if you just did your traditional beach staining kind of uh, at low tide. So we thought this was a nice example of kind of an an ecological phenomenon or or pattern uh, that we found with eDNA that wouldn't have been as easy to observe uh, with other methods. Uh, next, oh oh, I think it worked. I think it worked. Okay, so um, just some conclusions here and uh, some kind of parting parting words on the eDNA. So uh, eDNA is a great tool for understanding presence, absence, um, community composition, and sort of abundance. And basically, what I mean there is like you can you can pretty much tell what's like really common, what's kind of common, and what's not that common, right? So like you know, salmon are really common in eelgrass or around eelgrass. Um, and then there's some things that are sort of really spotty. So like this is a link cod. This is um, and you can tell that like we only get, you know, we only got like one detection. And that makes a lot of sense. Link cod are really rare um, in Juno. So you can basically see like, okay, salmon are really common. They're really abundant. You know, link cod are really rare. And then there's some things that are kind of in the middle and patchy. So things like uh, like gadids, uh, for example. 
And so like gadgets would be a nice sweet spot for this eDNA kind of tool where, you know, they're not everywhere because if it's if they're everywhere, it's not as interesting um, or as useful. But, you know, they're in some places and not in others. So like they're, um, you know, really common in this Bridget low tide sample and then this echo high tide sample. And that might be telling us something uh, useful. Uh, let's see. I'm getting. Wait, it was working. OK, that's still working. OK. Uh, we think eDNA is especially useful in near shore communities where DNA is more concentrated. We've done a lot of work on these offshore surveys in like, you know, 300 meters in the Gulf of Alaska where, and, and, and that can be a little tougher, but, um, you know, eDNA seems to to compare really favorably to sort of traditional methods like, um, like beach staining um, in terms of community compositions and near shore habitats. Uh, yeah, AFSC is currently largely focused on these offshore and Arctic applications because we spend a lot of time on these, these, uh, you know, huge fisheries for Pollock and things like that. But we're really interested in hearing about local, um, uh, understanding kind of uh, local patterns and hearing about uh, local applications. And uh, yeah, definitely please don't hesitate to reach out um, if you'd like to discuss potential eDNA applications, if you have a question about this. Um, yeah, we'd really love to hear from you for sure. And maybe we can do a probably a long question thing uh, after Amy Lee's next, next part here. But um, Really interested to hear if you have any questions, any potential uses. Um, and yeah, hopefully that's a nice primer on eDNA um, to get the conversation started. Uh, yeah, do you want to do, can we do some questions now? I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I got a mic here for you. I lived in the Huna area. When the elders were talking about fishing on the mainland, Huna, I mean, uh, Huna is located on Chichikov Island, but our major home was the mainland Glacier Bay Exclusion Inlet. And, uh, and I heard discussion from our older fishermen that the dog salmon, for instance, they could tell the difference mainland dog salmon and those that spawned and grew on uh, Chichikov Island not only by the taste, but by the color. Interestingly enough, the ones off the mainland were bluish, the backs, blue backs. And the ones on Chichikov Island were brownish. So environment plays a really big part in this. It's really cool to see and learn that the DNA gets left behind because we got tons of it on our land. Yeah, that, <laughs> um, that's really neat. Um, maybe just to pause right there. So. I talked about eDNA, but um, a lot of our research is also on kind of understanding the genetic basis of of um, sort of differences in uh, phenotypes, so differences in how things look and how they act and how that that sort of relates to um, how they've adapted. And uh, salmon is kind of a large piece of that. Um, and so I don't know too much about chum salmon population structure in Southeast Alaska, but those type of things are really valuable for us because uh, we can kind of hear something like that and then go look to see um, if that pattern sort of if we see it in our genetics and we actually have seen that before in a, a village near homer where um, there was sort of knowledge of these different colors that turned out to sort of actually be pretty related to um, genetic differences which was was really neat but yeah that's that's awesome hi I, this presentation was really interesting. It got my wheels turning because yesterday we were talking a lot about invasive green crabs. Um, and I'm wondering if this would be an interesting tool to use to start like testing for the presence of green crabs in different communities. Um, just the molt walks, et cetera, are useful, but if we can be testing for like the eDNA of green crabs in Alaskan waters, like that could open up a whole new possibility um, for detecting them. So I don't know if that's already happening, if you are looking at crustaceans and crabs, um, but just, I was really excited about this application um, for what we were talking about yesterday. Yeah, you should probably hand the mic to Meredith there, actually. Oh, nice. um, but one quick thing is that, and I'm curious what Meredith thinks about this, but we have done a little bit of work trying to get some crab primers going, um, and it seems like they don't shed as much DNA as fish. So like any Juno, Juno local will, will sort of get this one. Um, those Echo Echo Cove samples, um, we looked for Dungeness crab in those Echo Cove samples and we found a little bit, but like not a lot. And anyone that's gone to Echo Cove would be like, you should see a lot of Dungeness crab in the eDNA samples. So um, yeah, Meredith can take it over, but I, uh, it's kind of already happening. Uh, it may not work as well as fish, but I think it's a good tool and yeah, take it away. 
Yeah, that is kind of basically the summary of it. But um, yeah, it's already being used in Metlakatla. Um, we started doing that back in, I think, initially we wanted to do it in 2020, but then with COVID, um, we didn't get started until 2021 collecting eDNA samples there. And we're kind of in the process now of interpreting those results and comparing it with the trap data to see how it compares. But I think that there is a big, um, like as Wes mentioned, crabs don't shed as much DNA as, as a slimy fish does. But I think there is a good application for detecting green crab early, like in that megalope, megalope how do you say it, Carrie? <laughs> megalope stage. Um, there's some other trapping methods to collect the megalope, but, but they're harder to identify. And that'd be a great application for eDNA to identify green crab at that early invasion stage. So. I'd, I'd like to just quickly follow up with that because the work that Janelle has done, you know, they've they've, they've been doing eDNA, like Catla, like Meredith said, and they've taken samples from, um, they have some fish traps in Tamgas Bay where, you know, when the tide goes out, it's like a pool of water. And they had green crab in a trap in that pool of water. They sampled that water, they ran it through eDNA, and it didn't hit. And they knew there was green crab in that pool of water. So there's a lot more to understand and to know and to nuance. It's, it doesn't seem like it's going to be the smoking gun the way it can be with some fish, but a lot more to work through. So just a little more information on what they're seeing from the great work that Metlakatla Indian community is doing. Yeah, it's awesome. That's really good context for sure. I have a question over here. Um, I had the same question about the green crab um, eDNA, but uh, I know that we are, um, as, as a collective in the region, we're starting to look at why there is some black seaweed die off, but also possibly some invasive Japanese seaweeds growing in the region. Is there going to be work in that area to find out if, if, if it's like, if you do a water sample and there could be an invasive seaweed or kelp? Yeah, I think that eDNA is a is a really great um, tool for that kind of question, and um, kind of a, around the world, people have used it in like ballast water to look for invasive species and things like that. Um, if so we don't usually do plants. We have like um, like no expertise in uh, kelp at all. But if you're interested in that, I think I could probably connect you to some folks that do for sure. Um, but it seems like a great application, definitely. Cool. All right, thanks for the questions. And yeah, if some more pop up, uh, definitely uh, I'll be around for a little bit. Thanks, Wes. All right, I'm gonna close with our, a little bit of information on our equity and environmental justice strategy. So I just wanted to share with you that our strategy is now available. It was a multi-year iterative process that helped guide us to serve communities more equitably and effectively. It reflects the input from the, we received from all of our tribal partners and the public, and this is a nationwide effort. And so we've identified three equity and environmental justice goals just based on the recommendations we've received from all of our tribal partners and the public. The first one deals with making sure that we have um, prioritized the identification and equitable treatment and involvement of underserved communities. So any coastal communities that don't otherwise have a voice, we wanna be out there talking with them and finding out what are those needs and how can we best serve those. And then the second goal really has to do with creating equity in how we deliver our services through NOAA Fisheries and how we support all of you. And we're looking for feedback in that. And then to prioritize our mission work so that we can demonstrate progress. It's really important. We've received a lot of information from folks saying, hey, we wanna know how you're measuring these goals. We wanna make sure that there's success here and how are you going to show that to us? So it's that accountability piece, right? So I wanted to share a little bit about the public feedback that we received. We really need to do a bottom-up approach where we're talking with these communities, we're looking at local needs, and we're addressing those needs. We're not doing a very good job at that um, on the federal level. We need to make sure that we support community participation in science and management. So we've heard from a lot of you, a lot of the tribes have said, hey, please help us elevate our voices, particularly within subsistence needs and we need to make sure that we're engaging with groups that don't otherwise have a voice. Maybe they're not attending the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Maybe they're finally finding that that's a hostile environment or one in which they just don't have the funds to be able to go to. So we need to make sure that we're engaging with more diverse groups. 
we also need to make sure that we're looking at each of those communities and what are some of the benefits that fish have to those communities and how can we then wrap that into an implementation plan to make sure that you could tap into those benefits on a regular basis. And then promoting that equity in fisheries, resource access, aquaculture, and in protected resources. So those are our marine mammals. And we also need to make sure that we're supporting territorial and tribal rights, that we're really giving the tribes a voice at the table and allowing them to interact with us on a regular basis and making sure that our workforce and our fishery management councils represent you so that we have seats on those councils and we have people joining the NOAA family that are, are native and have that native background and that perspective that they can share. And then finally, we heard from the public to make sure that we're just not monitoring the inputs, what we're doing out there, or how many meetings we're having, but really looking at the measurable outcomes that benefit our local communities. And then some of the implementation recommendations as we're putting together an implementation plan, we need to communicate early and often. We heard this from our tribal partners and the public at large, our stakeholders. We need to make sure that we're coordinating with our fishery management councils, our NOAA line offices, and all the other federal agencies that might be involved in whatever topic we're talking about. And that we're supporting the capacity. So again, it's hiring local place-based staff, making sure that native perspectives are part of our work and investing in cultural and language expertise was another thing that was pointed out to us that we may, not, may need to reach out to all of you. Maybe you have connections within your tribes for language expertise that can help us reach small communities. But then look at the social impacts of the management decisions that our federal agency makes on the people and those communities and what do those impacts look like? Are they negative? Are they positive? How can we lessen the amount of negative effects and increase the positive effects in all of your communities? So right now we're in the, we just finished creating an engagement plan and Alaska regional team. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute and we're getting ready to engage with all of you in our communities. So at the bottom of the screen here, you'll see a link to our equity and environmental justice strategy that we just finalized. And then we were working to develop an implementation plan. So our Alaska team needed to develop uh, a group of people that had diverse and um, were multifaceted in their expertise and backgrounds. So on our team here in Alaska, we have leadership, we have program managers, we have our social scientists, we have our outreach and education uh, experts, we have our tribal and community liaisons from both the region and our North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and then we have our tribal research coordinator that's on the team that's helping us as we go out. So Alaska, poses many challenges, right? How are we going to accomplish this feat when Alaska holds the largest land mass and the largest coastline of all states in the United States? So for us, it's a matter of developing a implementation plan or engagement plan that involves two phases. So phase one started in May. We started reaching out to different communities and fishing groups and it'll go through December where we begin conversations with all of you. And we talk about what are some of the needs in your community, but first, how can we best sit down with you? Is it a face-to-face? -face? Is that your preferred method to share some of the needs that you have um, and where we might be falling down on the job and where we can make improvements within our agency? And then what's the best season and timing? Right now is not the good time to interact with folks. They're gathering, they're getting ready for the winter months. Um, what are some of the best locations for us to have hubs or create meetings where we can talk with you? Is that in Juneau here in the Southeast or would that be in Sitka or Huna or Ketchikan? Where would you prefer that we meet with you? And then the best ways to solicit that feedback. So we're looking for feedback from you on how we can develop this. And then an under phase two, which will begin at the beginning of the calendar year, January through December, we're working on a fiscal year budget for this next fiscal year. For many of you that work with federal agencies or, or you work for a federal agency, you know that our fiscal year ends um, in September. We'll start a new fiscal year, October 1. 
but we're asking for some funding so that we can go out and meet with you face to face. We can travel to you so you don't have to travel to us or we don't have to rely on Zoom or other virtual platforms to talk to you about some of those needs and how we can build those needs into our implementation plan. And so the communities that we've identified that we do need to provide better services to and work with our Alaska federally recognized tribes and corporations, and of course our native organizations. We also need to reach out to all of our coastal fishing communities. Those are often the rural communities that don't get a voice at the table, that don't always are, um, have a chance to have a conversation with us. And so we're talking about reaching out to small scale fishing associations and our coastal fleets. We also are putting a huge emphasis on our subsistence users because we're hearing that need continually from you. We also want to talk to our seafood industry, our vessel crew, our processing plant workers, our cannery workers, because oftentimes they don't have input into the uh, system. And there's a lot of downsides um, when it comes to not having a voice within those um, companies in order to share what are some of the needs or improvements that need to occur there. And then we also want to talk to some of our small boat charter fishery folks that um, may not necessarily have a seat at the table at our councils. And then finally, we're also going to reach out to our Alaska rural community teachers, our students, and um, some of the families in order to determine how can we improve in our educational and outreach. And these are some of the topics that we're going to be talking about in our phase two. Uh, how do we share that information? How would you like to have those um, two-way conversations with us? Um, in what form? What are some of the topics and the timing? And who are some of the great points of contact that you would recommend for your tribe in order to share that information with us? And then what are some of the services in your community that you depend on? Or maybe there were services in the past and NOAA decided to get rid of those or we don't provide support for those. How could we um, revive those projects? And then what are some of the limits and barriers to using marine resources under NOAA's jurisdiction? Are you having trouble getting a ceremonial um, halibut permit, for example? Um, what are some of the ways in which we can improve our services to you? And then what are some of the barriers to the management processes? And I'm thinking um, fisheries because that's one of the biggest things right now is that a lot of our tribes are saying, you know, the council is not a safe place for us to share some of these needs. We really need to elevate subsistence voices and food security. How do we do that? We can help you navigate through that. We can work through a plan and a process and put that into our implementation plan and have that approved and blessed by our headquarters office so we can move forward and, and making some real measurable changes. And then we also heard the need for increased partnerships with scientific activities. So doing scientific research and making sure that if tribes are frustrated with some of the research that's on the ground, they have input into that, or they're able to have a tribal consultation with us to talk about that. So we're working with our Alaska Fisheries Science Center on that piece as well. And so how can you get involved? Contact any one of the three that are listed on the slide here. Myself, we also have our Alaska Fisheries Science Center Community Program Manager, Maggie Mooney Seuss. Some of you may know her. She's wonderful to work with. She can help you out. And also we have our Alaska Fisheries Science Center Tribal Research Coordinator, Mabel Baldwin Schaefer. You may know her as well. So coming soon, we're developing an Alaska EEJ flyer. So it will share about our kickoff event that's coming up October 25th. We're going to start out with a big conference call. It's for all of our tribal parties and also our um, rural fishing communities uh, that may not be tribal, maybe local Alaskans. And we're going to kick off our engagement outreach. So stay tuned for more information. We're really excited about this process and really looking forward to working with you to hear about what your community needs are so we can build those into our implementation plan. So Gunish for your gift of time today, and I'll open it to any questions, um, perhaps that are related, related to the funding opportunities, AOAs, or our equity and environmental justice strategy. Any questions? Hey, 
for the AOAs, how would a community get, if they were interested in pursuing aquaculture, how do they, who, do, who would they get in contact with if they wanted to maybe be included as an AOA or participate in that AOA decision process? That's a great question. Our lead is Alicia Bishop, and her information is on one of the previous slides, but feel free to reach out to me. I can exchange a card with you today, and we would love to have you involved in that development. We're getting ready for the public release of that announcement, and then we'll be holding a workshop starting next spring. So once we get those dates and locations nailed down, we'll be able to put you on our listserv and distribution list, and we can send that information out to you if you're interested in joining us and developing this. Great, thanks. Good morning, my name is Karen Grosskreutz. I live and work here on Taku Kwan and Ak Kwan lands. Um, and I have some questions and recommendations for the AOA process. Um, I appreciate that the federal government and the state government are both represented in the room today and are making statements about improving how things are done. So I'm wondering, in the AOA process, when it was done in other locations, it's all been in federal waters. Now this in state waters, I think there's some opportunities to, in addition to essential fish habitat and um, environmental species protection, to include spatial data layers for traditional harvest areas. And I would think that um, the, the methods that are being used are actually having to be recreated entirely because it's a new process that's gonna set precedent. And I think folks here have a three years or longer to make big inroads on that. And instead of starting with industry, you should consider starting with which areas will not be on the table as a serious constraint layer. A lot of things I need to talk to you about this. Great, I'm really excited to connect with you and we'll definitely be opening those conversations with our program lead for aquaculture. There are some sensitive areas that we need to be aware of and it's important for us to choose the right aquaculture opportunity areas. So we're working closely with our state, water, our state partners, of course, with the state of Alaska, because we need to do that in order to develop these and identify these in state waters. But again, um, the tribes play an important part. We have a trust relationship with you, a federal tribal trust relationship. We need to hear from you on what areas might we avoid and where are those key characteristics of areas that we want to develop in. And that will help set the tone and get us off on the right foot and the right basis as we identify these aquaculture opportunity areas. Thank you. Well, I just had a question about uh, the state waters. Is that the three mile zone? Correct. Okay, so we'd be just talking about anything out to the three mile zone. So all the federal water past that would be off the table. That's a great question. I'm not sure if it includes the EEZ. That would be a good question for my lead, Alicia. So if you don't mind, I could take that question yeah, back I was to just her and you know, I was, get yeah. back to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because that's from the three mile to the two. Yeah, then it might help us narrow down the areas in our area that we would specifically say this may or may not be a good idea. And these are the areas that we would inside that three mile zone. But if it goes out to the 200 mile zone, th then we're, well, we have issue with that too, but we'll leave the trawlers alone. Great, I would love to hear from you, but I believe it's just in state waters, but I'll confirm that and get back to you. Um, I just wanna make a quick comment. Thank you for your information today. And I just wanna comment for any of the tribes in the room. Um, those NOAA grants that were shared, those due dates are coming up pretty soon. October 16th is pretty soon. And that's also the same timeline for those BIA tribal resiliency grants, right? October 13th. And so if um, there's interest in that, if there's opportunity in that that you're interested in, this is um, a way that CEDAR can support you folks. So maybe we can all get on a call next week or you can send me an email and we can talk about, hey, how can we get your tribe to apply for those dollars? Um, so if that's something you're interested in, um, let me know and we can um, maybe get some groups that are interested in the same projects working together or I can work with you as an individual tribe to help some of, you know, anything that you need, the grant formatting process, some of the writing, anything that looks like that, that is, that is my job. That's what I want to connect with you folks about. So just a quick PSA. If you're interested in those dollars, send me an email and we'll we'll get to typing fast. Well, 
Uh, thank you to Amy Lee and Wes for the presentation with Noah. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you for the reminders on that, Carrie. Uh, we can break for lunch, but quick announcements really quick. Um, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council is seeking nominations for a tribal person uh, to sit on the advisory panel. It is a three-year term, so keep that in mind. Um, I don't have any more information. Um, I'll try and get that. If you guys have any more questions, come back to me. Uh, lunch is on your own. And just a reminder, as stated earlier today, uh, some of us are meeting at the Ramada to just essentially have kind of a, a loose lunch chat and visit. So um, be back by 12.55 if you guys want to be eligible for the raffle prizes. And we'll start at 1 o'clock with Meredith giving her presentation on EDNA. Uh, sorry, I just also want to state too that uh, if you guys want to, feel free to come back in here and sit in here to have your lunch. This room is open. Just a reminder. Ooh, a pre-clap even. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much for having me today, guys. Um, I'm Meredith Pokar. I live up in Haines and do kind of, I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, I work with the Chilkoot Indian Association. I also have my own little consulting company and do a lot of work with tribes throughout Alaska through oceans and earth environmental. Can you guys hear me? Or maybe I need to talk closer. Um, and maybe I was gonna do like a little interactive thing at the end, but maybe we'll just do it at the beginning while we wait for folks to show up. Um, so the NOAA presentation with Wes gave a great kind of intro to environmental DNA or eDNA. And you guys may be wondering like, how can I actually use this in my home community? And so, We'll just, you know, it is after lunch and maybe people got to walk around, but before we like settle in and start digesting lunch, um, I'm gonna maybe ask you to stand up and move around a little bit, but I'll have questions that will get you up. So first one, who in here eats fish? Stand up if you eat fish. Stand up, don't even raise your hand, just stand up. <laughs> um, awesome, so yeah, that's like, you know, obviously a huge group of us. That's why probably most of us live in Alaska. Um, okay, you can sit back down. <laughs> We're gonna have people get up and down. But so who in here is working on projects that monitor fish in your communities? Either you're doing stream surveys or somehow monitoring fish in your communities. Okay, we only have Ithiania, but I'm sure there's more out there. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> so who else is in here looking for invasive species in your communities? Yeah, so we got a couple folks doing that type of work. Um, who in here is doing harmful algal bloom or phytoplankton monitoring in your communities? Yeah, so we got a handful of those as well. And so it's kind of what this is getting at is that all of these, there's traditional sampling methods to answer a lot of these questions, but there are also questions where eDNA could be a tool that could be applied. And there's a lot of coulds and sh you know ifs and <laughs> in that, but uh, we'll go over a little bit more of how that would work. And as people are trickling in, we'll just, we'll just get going. So um, yeah, Wes gave a good intro to what is environmental DNA, but this is basically just DNA that is shed from organisms and then is sampled from the environment. And so it's a little bit like CSI, um, like no fish is gonna swim through a stream without, without us knowing about it. Um, but you can take samples of eDNA through soil or water or air. And the beauty of environmental DNA is it's it's not invasive. You don't have to sample the organism itself or handle that organism. You can just take a sample from the environment. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. So yeah, how does eDNA work? Um, so basically you collect a water sample. Most of what I'm gonna talk about is all collecting eDNA samples through water. But yeah, also remember that if you have questions of soil, microbes, or species in the soil or even air, there's eDNA techniques for that as well. Um, but right now what most of us are doing is collecting a water sample 
you will filter all of that water down. Um, there's a lot of different varieties of how that looks, but you'll basically be capturing all the DNA of all the species in your sample on a filter. And then from that, um, in the lab, we will extract all of the DNA that is on that filter. And so that's just one of the processes. And then, you know, what do we do with that? We have this, you know, we have all the extracted DNA from your sample. How are we going to figure out what's going on and what species of interest are there? And there's kind of two different avenues that we can analyze eDNA samples with. One is this single species approach where we're just looking for one or maybe two um, species of interest. So most of these methods are using either qPCR or digital PCR. This is really sensitive and really precise for looking at just a very few number of species. Um, it's also, you know, requires less time and is less expensive than the, our other approach. Uh, the other approach is this multi-species approach. This is also called DNA metabarcoding or sequencing. It can be less precise, as we saw in, in Wes's results that he showed. You know, we might get like all of the, the getted species, but we're not going to get specific cod species within that. Um, same Similar things with salmonids. You might be able to tell that you have salmonids there, but you're not going to be able to you know, tell which species of salmonids. Um, so it kind of depends on the question which approach you're going to want to implement. Um, so what can you do with this? Some of the things. So some of the things that we're looking into is relative abundance of different species in a system. So population monitoring. I'm going to talk about our ongoing Eulicon population monitoring. It's also been used for salmon here in Oak Creek. Um, it's very usable for presence absence, and so this is our kind of a great tool for invasive species monitoring. Um, as we mentioned earlier, folks in Metlakatla are using it for green crab. There are some, some caveats with that as well, but um, it's also been used for pike and elodia in Alaska. And uh, yeah, some of other applications, these are more for the, the metabarcoding or the multi-species approach. Would be that marine monitoring, kind of what Wes was talking about, deep sea monitoring or near shore habitat um, uses or usage or biodiversity monitoring. And then uh, another kind of pretty common use for eDNA is diet analysis or biodiversity assessments through diet analysis. Um, and so we'll talk about a, a loon study that took place in the Arctic looking at loon diets that were kind of unknown prior to this study. So there's kind of two main questions out there in this like forefront of eDNA, which is a, a relatively new kind of science technology that is being implemented. So the questions are, can we quantify abundance? Um, you know, and for a lot of management questions, just knowing whether or not a species is there isn't necessarily enough. Like you need to know the quantity or at least relative quantity of species. And then how reliably can we detect more than one species at once? And that's that biodiversity assessment. We'll kind of go through how eDNA is being used for both of these questions. We'll just start with this individual species. And again, this is like a single species approach. So, um, so one of the big ones that I've been part of for quite a while and is just continuing to grow, which is so awesome and exciting, is uh, I can't even call this the Alaska Tribal Yulecon Monitoring Network anymore because it's all the stretches all the way down to the Fraser River in British Columbia. And so this is a pretty awesome network of tribes that are using environmental DNA to monitor Yulecon spawning populations. And they're getting like actual population data that is otherwise not being collected. So it's kind of a, a pretty awesome way that tribes are kind of taking the, the lead in, in being the managers of this important subsistence resource. And so we started doing this in Northern Southeast in 2014. And then Central BC, they came on doing it in 2019. Um, Ithiania, the Ketchikan tribe, we started in 2022. And then this past spring, Yakutat started in 2023. So um, yeah, and we'll you know, hopefully just continue to grow those that monitoring network. So I'll go over some of the results. This is the in Haines on the Chilkoot River where we started monitoring. Um, started doing eDNA in 2014, but prior to that, we were using a marker capture method, which is kind of a more traditional fisheries population monitoring technique. Um, and as you can see, we, you know, we had a lot of different variations in the returns. We also didn't do marker capture in 2020, although it was a pretty big return, but we couldn't due to COVID, we couldn't have crews out. And then we had no run in 2021 and 2022. 
So it's kind of shocking. But we did have a run this year. So it's awesome that it showed up. Um, so that's the marker capture data. And then this is just comparing. You know, at first when we started, we didn't even know if this was going to work for population data. You know, back in 2014, it was still a relatively new concept. And so we were still, still were doing and are doing the marker capture method to compare these two techniques. Um, and two of the, the kind of the ways that we analyze our eDNA data is there's, we have two metrics. One is looking at the size of the peak in the eDNA concentration. So these are eDNA data down here compared with our marker capture data up here. And so in some years, that peak might be, you know, kind of a good metric. And then in some years, also this area under the curve. And so the thing that we get with eDNA when we're taking daily samples is we can get this trend throughout the run. So rather than just one population data point that we get with a marker capture, we can get these within run dynamics, which can be pretty exciting to see and can help, um, yeah, just understand the population better. So this is just a, some statistical regression. Don't get too in the weeds with this, but this is just a, a way where we were comparing how our eDNA trends and our marker capture trends are, um, how correlated they are with each other. Um, so overall, pretty pretty tight correlation. We do see like in these upper um, years where we have higher population estimates, we have kind of a higher margin of error. Um, I think that's you know, likely associated with higher margin of error in both techniques, both with the the marker capture and the eDNA. Um, overall, it seems like it is working and it's a technique that we can use to at least gauge relative abundance. So this is looking at six of our rivers in northern southeast Alaska over our time period of monitoring them. Don't pay too much attention to these graphs and it's probably pretty hard to read even back there. But um, the overall trend we can see is that 2019 was a huge run that we had across the board. All of our rivers that we were monitoring was a huge run. Um, and so we can capture that through this eDNA sampling. And then another thing that we can use with our eDNA data is um, correlate that and compare it with our wildlife surveys that are also doing every day that we are out um, taking eDNA samples. So this is our partners up in Skagway. Um, this is their data from two years ago. And the blue line is the eDNA concentration and the kind of orange bars are the mu gull counts each day. And kind of what this just shows is we're seeing a peak in eDNA right around the same time where we're seeing the largest concentration in gulls, which if anyone's been around for these hooligan runs, it's not surprising. There's you know, thousands and thousands of birds out there during these runs, and it's a pretty exciting time. So this is our, our results from 2022. I'm like eagerly waiting the 2023 results um, for the Unic River, but we don't have them in yet. So <laughs> this is 2022's results. Um, yeah, this just shows a couple of the different locations that we monitored on the Unic River and some of the tributaries and the different trends. Um, one of these things is the Unic River is just kind of always a beast in itself to get there. <laughs> if Ian, you can, can attest to that. Getting there, getting there in time, especially like when they're they spawning in early March sometimes. And this year they were spawning under the ice and there's a lot of difficulty in getting there. So, but um, you at least being able to take some eDNA samples can improve our overall understanding of what is what's happening and when the spawning is happening. So, um, and then, yeah, some of the work that's going down, going on down in British Columbia, and they say Ulichan down there, not Hooligan, <laughs> where you looking? Um, this is just comparing eDNA with egg count data, and we're seeing similar trends um, like there as well, which isn't that surprising. And then um, our folks in Yakutat um, last fall started a coho monitoring program to monitor coho during a time from the, starting at the end of August through October when there wasn't other coho monitoring happening on the Seacook River. So this was just a, a pilot kind of proof of concept year last year and they're going for it again this season. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have even more data. But so this just shows, you know, a, a low amount of coho initially in August and then a peak kind of around the beginning of October. So that correlates with what we're seeing on the ground. And um, yeah, we hope to be able to refine these trends over time. And then this is a study that took place at the Ock Creek Weir. This was a couple years ago, but this was kind of one of the earlier studies that helped us prove up this concept of using eDNA to monitor relative abundance. 
Um, and this is with monitoring salmon escapement, so the adults going through the weir at Ock Creek, and then also the smolt out migration. Um, and so, yeah, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but basically this is up here, we have the weir counts, and then this is the flow corrected eDNA rate. And so just basically multiplying by the river flow. Um, that, that you can imagine if you have five DNA particles in a stream at you know X flow, but then that flow gets doubled, that, that amount of DNA could be diluted in your sample. And so the having flow measurements can be pretty important for abundance monitoring. But overall, we're seeing similar trends. The peaks are lining up with the peaks in the weir count data. And so that's kind of what we want to see for doing abundance monitoring. And obviously, daily sampling helps improve the resolution of these trends over time. Um, and so this is just a, an image of the anatomic waters catalog for southeast Alaska. So we have you know roughly 6,000 salmon streams in southeast Alaska. I don't actually know the number of salmon weirs or where fish and game or agencies are monitoring salmon populations, but it's much less than 6,000. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about tool, eDNA is, is a tool. It's not, you know, going to be the home run hitter for all of our monitoring needs, but it's a tool in our toolbox that we can use. And so kind of the, you know, can we use eDNA to improve the spatial coverage of our monitoring? I don't think it's necessarily going to replace some of the weirs, although maybe in some cases that would be great. Um, but can we at least improve our overall knowledge of salmon abundance across the region? It's kind of one of the big questions with eDNA. Um, as I mentioned, water flow, that can be important, but it's also not necessary. And I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, I know a big limiting factor in a lot of our rivers is we don't have discharge monitoring or you know, a way to actually monitor discharge. So we can get around that. Um, but the beauty of eDNA is that one technician can go around, one or two, maybe a boat driver, can go around and sample a bunch of different rivers within one day. And so then the question is, like, is monitoring more rivers with maybe less precision better than monitoring few with more? I think that it's maybe not quite that much of a trade-off, but can we just enhance our overall monitoring by including eDNA sampling along with our ongoing um, other techniques? So now we'll move into some of this invasive species monitoring. And so this is more of that presence absence. So this was a few years ago, but on the Kenyai Peninsula, they had eradicated northern pike. And so they were looking to, um, this was a, a proving that it was eradicated. So they had gone in and, and were taking samples to confirm that eradication. And then also with Elodia up near Fairbanks area. Fish and, these were two fish and wildlife projects. And so these can be used to yeah, have that early detection and then in influence rapid response, but also that treatment efficacy. So making sure that those species are eradicated where we think they are. Um, then as we talked about, yeah, the green crab monitoring, there's definitely some, some analysis that needs to happen with these eDNA samples. And we're working on that to see the trends and how that, um, what sense we can make of that. But I think that there is some potential here, as I mentioned earlier, um, like crabs don't shed that much DNA. <laughs> so that is kind of, it's a really tricky part of their life cycle. But if we can sample them at that earlier life cycle before they have that hard carapace shell, um, maybe in that megalope stage, I think that that could be a good option um, also to have that early detection of a pretty, pretty gnarly invasive species. So um, here's our, our two questions for eDNA research again. We'll just kind of talk a couple or show a couple examples of this multi-species approach and kind of more diversity monitoring questions and how eDNA is being applied to answer that. Um, so this is the same thing Wes mentioned. This is that uh, nearshore fish community assessment. And yeah, just to reiterate, as Wes said, you know, some of the species were found in all of the habitat types. And then it was also found that some are pretty habitat specific. And so eDNA does seem like a pretty um, good tool for nearshore habitat and biodiversity assessments. Um, this is an uh, image, these Venn diagrams. You'll kind of find a lot of these in a lot of different eDNA papers out there. Um, it's comparing how eDNA detections, um, or showing how eDNA detections compare with kind of these traditional trawl or net survey techniques. Overall, we see that they're, you know, getting pretty much the same species or somewhere eDNA is getting them, but trawls are not. And so you know, maybe species 
are avoiding trawls or um, these more deeper pelagic fish where depending on where you're taking your eDNA sample in the water column, you may be missing those species. So just sampling design um, considerations as well, but all overall um, DNA can kind of be pretty ubiqui ubiquitous in a water column. And then this is a recent study by some folks with USGS in up near in the Arctic. And so they were looking at the loon diet. And so loon, this is actually, I didn't realize this. <laughs> I'm not that much of a bird scientist, but loons like 100% feed underwater. <laughs> so you don't really know what they're eating unless you go and hang out underwater with them. Um, and so, and they also feed on different species in the freshwater and in the marine system. And so it came out that these blackfish and these nine spine sculpin were pretty huge components of their diet um, in these Arctic freshwater systems. And so prior to this study, they didn't know that. And this was using that metabarcoding um, kind of multi-species approach again. So they went and collected some loon feces samples and, and uh, yeah, tested them for <laughs> what they were eating. So, um, yeah, it's one thing to you know collect the samples and filter them and preserve them. That's like a very easy, tangible task that we can all do within our own respective communities. Um, some of the more like the qPCR or metabarcoding analysis typically needs to be sent to a lab somewhere. Um, we have an ongoing partnership for pretty much all, or it is all of our Southeast Alaska eDNA projects that are with tribes, all of those samples are being sent to Oregon State University to Dr. Tall Levi's lab. That's a great partnership, um, you know, <laughs> for now. Who knows if that will if we'll continue to grow, how many more samples we'll be able to send his lab and what capacity they will continue to have. Um, but so we kind of are starting to look for some new labs and new lab resources within the region. So Chugach Regional Resource Commission just was awarded funding last year to start up their own eDNA lab in Seward. This will primarily serve South Central tribal communities um, and, and their questions around that. But I think there's, there's also a lot of momentum on establishing a Southeast Alaska eDNA lab. And so yeah, hopefully we'll have more, more updates on that, hopefully by this time next year even. <laughs> uh, there's also commercial eDNA labs that are out there as well. So um, all in all, why, why would you use eDNA? What can we use it for? Um, so, um, well, it's this non-invasive sampling technique. So if you have a threatened species or really rare species, this can be a good way to, to detect them, to determine whether or not they're presence in, present in your system. It can be really highly sensitive, especially that single species approach is really sensitive. Um, and you can also do a multi-species approach where you can kind of get that more biodiversity assessment. It reduces that need for species specific field training. And so for say like green crab megalope, which I've been told are really hard to identify or um, distinguish between other crab megalope, eDNA, taking an eDNA sample of that kind of megalope connect collection could be a good way to determine if you have any green crabs in that sample. Also reduces your permitting requirements because it's just taking a sample of water. You're not touching any fish. Um, and those one of the big things of eDNA, because this field is evolving quite rapidly, but those eDNA samples or those filters or the extracted DNA can be stored and saved for years and years to come. And so, you know, some of our, our work that has started back in 2014, now we're going back and running those same samples looking for other species of interest. So you can, they're saved, they're usually archived, every lab is processing them. It's kind of a part of the, the lab agreement. And then if you have other questions or depending on, you know, technological advancements, you can go back and, and ask new questions of those same samples. This is great for citizen science efforts um, involving community members or youth in the sample collection. There's not a whole lot of skill needed in the sample collection, just grabbing water and filtering it. And so um, we can get anyone trained up on that. And then yeah, just some of the things to consider with any study that you're going to implement. There's kind of all these, you know, what's our study system? Where are we going to be working? What's that like? Um, is it really braided or is it a single channel? Is it a lake? Um, some of those things. What are your focal species or species? Um, you know, do you want to detect many species or just a single species? And then, yeah, your overall goals. Is it just, you know, presence, absence, abundance, 
um, diet analysis. Kind of what, what are those questions? And then, you know, that will influence your study design, the number of samples. These are all things that I'm happy to talk to anyone about um, to help make your study as robust as possible. And then I think, you know, at the very least, just going out and collecting some samples and doing pilot studies and have a kind of proof of concept and get your feet wet would be a great way to, you know, get into the eDNA world. So I just want to say, finish Cheesh. Thank you all for having me here. And yeah, thanks to all the project partners that have worked on all of these eDNA projects over the years. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to. I don't know if we have time now or, uh, yeah, always contact me. I love, I'd love to talk about eDNA. Um, hey, Meredith, I was curious, uh, such an awesome project, by the way, but and I'm a little biased being from Yakutat, but um, I was wondering what are some of the limits um, to eDNA? I know you mentioned that like green crabs when they're in their hard shell phase don't shed DNA as much. Um, what else have you noticed? Yeah, so the limits of eDNA, that, that is a good question. <laughs> um, so it def definitely depends on the system and what your target species is. Um, so yeah, you know, if it's a, if you're looking for a really rare species like crab or, you know, hopefully green crab are pretty rare. Most of our, our rotters or non-existent um, and they're sh not shedding a lot of DNA, it's going to be much harder to detect. And so that would mean an increased level of sampling. Um, there's also some other, you know, there's a lot of other caveats to eDNA inhibit inhibition or like, you know, a lot of sediment in your sample can impact the ability of the, of the primers to actually function properly. But there's also cleanup steps to kind of get around that within the, the lab processing. So um, I would say it kind of depends, you know, there'll be a lot of caveats and, and things that come up depending on each study design, but I would say we can also, a lot of them can be worked through. Um, I'm not sure if you said it already. I missed a little bit of it, but um, how long does this eDNA like linger around in the waters? Like, is it different for like water that's still and water that's flowing? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So there's obviously like DNA is you know, it's degrading at, over time, and depending on direct sunlight and the temperature of the water, temperature of the air, and so there's a lot of factors that are at play there. Tidal currents river flow can all affect the amount of time that DNA is persisting. Um, but also, you know, we've seen it, it does stick around pretty long. So, um, but it, yeah, I would say it also depends on your system. <laughs> that was kind of one of my questions. Do you, if DNA is sticking around for a long time, do you, does that give you like false positives ever for species that were here, but they're not here due to migration patterns, et cetera? And I'm also wondering, like, how specific the level of specification eDNA can get to. Like, can you distinguish between individuals that were in this area? Um, can you also, I think you said you could also use eDNA for different, like, matrices. So what if I'm more interested in, like, soil or something like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, of, a lot in there. But um, so, yeah, the, how long it sticks around, definitely, you know, it depends on the system, again. Um, and then, yeah, soil samples. What, were, what was your other question in there? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I don't want to get too deep into genetics for um, everyone, but so eDNA samples, we, are, we're sampling the mitochondrial genome where there isn't, um, where your like kind of individual DNA that's specific to each individual is more, that's in the nuclear uh, genome. So mitochondrial genome shorter and um, is the same across species. So we won't, wouldn't be able to detect each individual, but there, you know, that is an advancement. That's a big question for a lot of eDNA research right now is, do, you know, a lot of people want to have that more fine scale population monitoring. And so, yeah, I think that that's coming, but we're not there yet. Are, has the Sika sound herring, have they been a part of any of these studies? We haven't done Sika sound herring yet, but um, a big 
push for the Chugach Regional Resource Commission's eDNA lab was to do heron monitoring in South Central Alaska. And so I think that, you know, there's, we, so far a lot of our work is focused on a Yulikon. And that's mainly because there isn't other, or relatively few agencies monitoring Yulikon in Southeast Alaska. And so herring does have a lot of overall monitoring. And so it just hasn't been a question that's been raised yet, but um, yeah, I'd be really interested in, in working with herring as well and seeing how well it works, especially in that more marine system and how well we can at least correlate eDNA concentrations during herring spawn with the other um, survey methods out there. Um, I was wondering, have you ever found any uh, human DNA in any of the samples that you've oh, yeah. taken? Oh yeah, human DNA but, definitely in them. <laughs> so what? Well, also like we're collecting them. Like I mean, so what, like, maybe I have my hair pulled back, but you know. So what's your assessment for when you guys do find human DNA? Like, well, so human DNA would show up in that multi-species approach, and if we have like a, a primer that we put in that can pick up humans, so a lot of times we're looking for fish where. Our genomes are, are so different that we're not necessarily going to pick up humans, but we do pick up dogs sometimes, cats um, in our in our samples, and we do pick up humans sometimes. But you just um, you can just set uh, like filters to to filter those reads out. Um, but yeah, because because humans are involved in the collection and the lab, and our DNA is just everywhere. Um, it's not it's not our our species that we're usually targeting, so <laughs> we just kind of throw those out. Cool. And I'm happy to answer questions later on or whenever. Thank you, Meredith. Appreciate that. Yeah, super exciting stuff. And yes, just to give a heads up, this is something that Clinkin and Hyde is currently looking at is getting a, a lab situated. So that lab aspect is something we're hoping to have in the future here in Southeast. All right. Uh, our next presentation is actually a, us at Clinkin and Hyda just discussing a, a bit about our transboundary work, what we want to see in the future, what, our, what we're doing right now, what we hope to be doing, um, where we're going, and what we want to see in the future out of that. So, uh, Sir Scott, Lindsay Pierce, uh, Jill Whites, and I will just give an overview of our program and some of the stuff we discuss. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, well, my name is Sir Scott. I'm one of the environmental coordinators here uh, with Native Lands and Resources for Clinkin and Haida. Uh, but one of the projects that we've been involved in is the uh, Transboundary Rivers project, where we do water quality sampling on the transboundary transboundary rivers uh, flowing in from uh, the Canadian side into the uh, Alaska waters. Uh, here's a little map uh, we can we're holding up. But we can have it posted up on the wall so you can take a closer look. Uh, but this gives us gives a little bit of um, uh, some information to look at, uh, an idea of what we're where we're sampling at, uh, the locations, and uh, the different partners involved. Um, but just a little bit of information on on the project or some of the things that I'd like to highlight. Um, well, maybe I'll let Lindsay. You want to say anything first before I get into that? <laughs> um, most of you guys know my name is Lindsay Pierce. I'm the other environmental coordinator, and the sir and I have been doing sampling since I was hired, so 2017. And we go on the Taku River, the Chilkat and the Klehini River, the Stikine River, Alsek River. And we were hoping to get on the eunuch, um, but Ketchikan beat us to it. And quickly, just to give you, give you guys a heads up, yeah, there is a lot. So um, what we are sampling for is heavy metals and physical parameters on, on these rivers. And it's due to the fact of um, mining being opened up on the other side of the border. And, and of course, because it's in Canada, we don't have any real policy say on that. So the best thing that we can do is ensure that we're collecting baseline data 
on these on these rivers, these systems, to ensure that you know where they're at right now, and if anything were to happen, we'd have that data to use as you know, litigation if it came down to that. And hopefully, we won't ever have to come to that. But that's what collecting that data is for. Um, Lindsay, sir, how many samples do we have on each of those rivers? Uh, currently, we have 36 samples on um, the Chilcat, the Kohimi, uh, the uh, Stikine. 34 on the Stikine 34. and the Taku. The Taku, okay. Um, but our, oh, go ahead. 19 on the Alsec. Okay. And the Alsec is only seasonal because you can only get up there from like May to October, depending on um, the guide schedule and the lodging schedule and all that. Yeah, and the hope is to get 36 samples, three years worth, or something to the effect of that. But as Lindsay stated, um, you know, getting to some of these areas is um, it's a little dangerous and, and it's out of the way. And, and in doing so, uh, it spreads out the amount of time we're able to actually sample. And as you know, in, in, in Alaska, uh, everything is weather dependent. Right, and just to add on to that, uh, some of these, a lot of these um, sampling seasons are really uh, dictated by uh, the ferry or, or flights. So uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, opportunities to go to these sites during the winter months uh, when the ferry schedule is either stopped or, or, or really slowed down or flights aren't flying to certain areas. Um, so uh, getting some of these uh, sampling sites or sam sites sampled during like the uh, early, you know, early part of the year, you know, December or January, all the way up into like March even, um, that is like a, uh, something that we are trying to do, but uh, we haven't necessarily done that because of those uh, logistical uh, hurdles. Uh, but that does bring us to another point of when we are going to these sites, uh, we do like to uh, partner with, uh, with you know, the local tribal organizations, uh, have them tag along, but also offer them some training opportunity uh, to sample with us, alongside of us, so that in those instances where we aren't able to be there in person and do the sampling, uh, they can hopefully pick up that that torch and uh, do those samples uh, since they're there locally uh, at their convenience. But um, that that is something that we do like to or wanting to build on. Uh, but that's also a uh, part of the project that I really enjoy is being able to uh, have that connection and communication with those uh, local tribal partners for this project. So it's really great, uh, not only for the project, but also just building uh, those relationships that can foster into other opportunities, you know, down the road. Yeah, well said, sir. <clears throat> yeah, adding to that too. I mean, this the the opportunity to build um, a collaborative um, process, one that we all can use, is, is super beneficial. And I'm hoping that um, as we're still doing this transboundary project and moving outside of calling it transboundary, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but more just sam basic water quality sampling um, on our southeast Alaska waters. Um, yeah, the opportunity there to have a uh, a systematic collaborative effort would be very beneficial for all of us. So I'll, we'll talk a little bit about the dead inlet, Lindsay, um, but we are in the process. So after we've collected all the samples, of course, there's the data aspect of it. And we hope to get that released a little bit, but I'll let Lindsay and Sir talk a little bit about how that process is going. So as far as the data, I know a lot of people asked us um, what we're finding and we are working on that. We're working with Kai Environmental on validating and um, getting our data ready to put into a website so we can share with the public. Um, it is a process, so it's taking us a little while, but we got up through, so we've been sampling since 2015 as a department and we got through 2019 <laughs> in data reconciliation so far. So um, we're halfway there almost, so maybe just a little bit longer. <laughs> so yeah, we, we currently just worked out um, uh, where well, we have a, a database, our own database that we're gonna house it in. And we decided to take that route instead of going a route where we're working collaboratively with, say, the federal government on like WQX. Some of you may know what that is. Um, the reason we decided to take the route of ha holding onto our own data is um, being able to access it when we want it, when we need it, and using it at our own discretion. Of course, again, this is 
will be public data and of course we will be sharing with anyone and whoever and, uh, and of course the tribes that we worked with they'll have that as well in their back pocket too but um yeah yeah and uh that's also another part i guess a big component that i really enjoy about a lot of this work with this uh, transboundary rivers project is that uh even we, there have been times where we've gone out sampling we run across the S usgs doing the same exact work um maybe not the same exact sampling but uh you know we cross paths in a lot of these uh, sample sites um because they have gauges there too at, at a lot of these sites but um <clears throat> it, it's kind of reassuring and um it actually gives me some actual like uh it fills me up with joy i guess because uh being able to say see that we're doing the same work that they're doing but we're doing it for you know the, the tribal tribal people being able to hold and collect that data on our own uh versus you know having that being uh, uh relegated through some other uh, process so uh like ray mentioned this is uh, public information we're hoping to have it available for everyone and uh, have it in your back pocket but uh, that is something that i really enjoy being able to to do that for for southeast and yeah and <clears throat> looking forward moving forward you know we mentioned that we've hit that essentially that 36 sample mark with most of our sites and now we're in a we're in an area now where we're, we need to move forward and and redesign our efforts on um, designing out another trans or water quality sampling project program within southeast alaska and then in doing so i think one of the things we want to be able to do is essentially reach out to partnering tribes or tribes that may want to partner to essentially help build out the quap priority areas of where we think we should be sampling, um, things of that nature. And so as we're getting ready to finish out this leg of uh, this part of the transboundary project and then going forward, you know, we're gonna be reaching out to the, the tribes to see what that collaborative, collaborative effort may look like. And we, we've seen it work in the past with the Akatak Lincoln Tribe, the Wrangell Cooperative Association, uh, we, Douglas Indian Association was on that for a little while, Chill Cat, Indian Village, Chilkoot Indian Association. Uh, these are several tribes that have followed the same model that we have. And so as we're designing out this next quap, you know, I think it's, an, it's important to have that collaborative effort in doing so to understand your guys' is in your guys' homeland, what are the priority areas that we should be looking at as well? Yeah, again, it just, like Ray mentioned, just to build on that, that's, that's kind of our next steps is, uh, uh, getting more involved with with you guys locally, uh, hearing some of the things that you're interested in, you're wanting to be addressed uh, for our new QAP because you know we want to take that into account too for how we e evolve for this program moving forward. So, um, but yeah, that's all I was wanting to mention. So, you know, in, in the spirit of things, with the with this um, environmental forum that we were hosting. This is the platform we used in the past to essentially build out our transboundary program as well. And so, the, you know, this effort we've got going on here, um, having this conference, it really allows for that collaborative tribal effort to, to move forward. So, um, you know, this is another platform we're using right now to reach out to you guys who may have interest in water quality sampling in Southeast. And I, I wanted to say that too, because again, you know, I, you guys heard me mention earlier about uh, the, the climate change fight and unfortunately that climate change fight is um, you know uh, more mining and unfortunately southeast alaska is one of those places where uh, there's a lot of exploration happening and in doing so we need to build out our capacity for that and while we're building out our capacity to ensure that we're looking and asking our federal partners or landowner partners to get that co-stewardship co-management effort Please, yeah, your input is I important. It's huge. Um, for, sorry, folks, uh, for those who maybe weren't here on the first day, my name is Jill Weitz. I'm with Clinton and Haida. Um, I serve as a natural resource advisor in the office of the president at Clinton and Haida, and I've been working on this transboundary issue for 13 years, um, and so everything that Sir and Lindsay and Ray just alluded to is spot on. You know, Ray mentioned the complexity of getting out to some of these systems to conduct, conduct sampling. Um, that has made it really challenging for everyone, and I know, yeah, KSC was just able to start getting up the UNIC um, within 
their traditional territory and that has a long history related to access because of the National Monument, but allowing tribes to conduct sampling is, um, is allowable within National Monuments, so, right? So it's like pushing those levers um, to get folks out on the land and in the rivers. Um, it's also really dang expensive um, to do so. And so I think that one thing that Clinton and Haida has learned uh, throughout this process, and Sir alluded to this, was that you know not only is it fun for them to be able to work with other collaborators in each of these communities and engage the other tribes, but we depend upon that support. And so how can we, going forward, expanding the scope of our monitoring, we've been doing water quality parameters. We wanna expand that to sediments, to fish tissues to really answer the question of impacts from heavy metals um, and not just potential uh, international mines, but domestic as well. Um, so endless opportunities there and to go one step even further, um, one aspect of this work that Clinton and Haida has been focusing on is the collaboration across the political border and working with British Columbia First Nations who are also conducting water quality monitoring efforts in these shared rivers. These are really <laughs> the most significant salmon systems in our region. Um, they're Pacific Salmon Treaty fish that come from these rivers. And so there's a lot of money that the federal government has invested in recovery efforts. Um, what are we doing to monitor? What are we doing to ensure that we have data to be able to detect, as Ray said, um, impacts from not just mining, any habitat destruction within the spawning and rearing grounds of these really significant salmon populations. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I'd, I could talk about this forever, but I'm curious to hear, I know that, you know, KIC has been building this out. Daniel's been working with um, uh, Kluckwan to, to garner data and supporting TNH. But I'm curious, others in the room, if folks have been doing, you know, yeah, uh, Yakutat has been monitoring in the LSEC, but I, what I, I focus on policy and I wanna hear from folks uh, ideas around opportunities for monitoring efforts, more collaboration. What are your needs? What have been your challenges as far as like garnering the permits you need to get out into these watersheds um, and to conduct those studies? And how can Clinton and Haida help support you in those efforts as, um, as we work closely with uh, our federal government and British Columbia First Nations to really expand the scope of some of this watershed or these watershed monitoring efforts. Um, so I'll pitch it there. I don't know if, Jen, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you wanna start and maybe share just kind of what you're finding, what your challenges and opportunities uh -huh. are. Um, well, I know one challenge is of course staff at KIC. I'm the Department of One with the environment. Um, initially, we had planned to go for two weeks um, to collect a bunch of water quality and eDNA information from the units, but um, due to weather and just it ended up being only I could go up there, um, we didn't collect as much as we had hoped for. And I know um, I had reached out um, to see if Clinkett and Haida could help, but I think they were kind of busy with stuff too. So I think possibly collaboration more, yeah more um talk about it maybe see if we can do i know i told ray i was like yeah. i wanted two days of this conference to just be yeah. on monitoring yep yeah. so really quickly jen can you explain why two weeks um well two weeks for mostly the ooligan okay. dna collection um because usually with water quality you want to um collect the samples and then process them on the same day that's just what i've been told um but maybe an overnight would be preferable. So, so <laughs> just to give you guys a heads up, um, the UNIC is easily the most difficult river system to get mm -hmm. into and out of in, in Southeast Alaska right now to do any uh, water quality sampling up there. Like Jill said, you, we can do water quality sampling up there, but because it's a designated wilderness area, there's a lot of restrictions put on it from Congress. Um, much of those restrictions are how to get in there. You can only get in there by boat. Um, and I, I think it can only have so much noise level decibels or something to the effect. Um, same with a helicopter. You, uh, you can't get in through a helicopter or a plane, really, correct? 
Um, we, we collaborate with the Forest Service in order to get there. So um, you have Ketchikan and then you have to go around the island and then you have to go through Burroughs Bay. And depending on how the weather is in Canada, Burroughs Bay can have really challenging waves. And we actually had to make four attempts to get to the Eunuch this year, just because the weather was really bad. And then the Eunuch itself was completely covered in ice. So when we did make it there, we had to haul our boats the whole mi a whole mile up the river by foot. So it's and definitely it's, a challenge. Yeah, definitely. And uh, the sandbars almost change daily, basically. Yeah, yeah. So. The the um, I think it's lower landing that where. There are a lot of sandbars there, and that tends to change a lot over the years. So yeah, that's something we want to be able to do with KIC. And in the past, because of the um, the UNIC being in a designated wilderness area, there's a lot of you know, essentially restrictions on what we can and can't do. But um, I've been advised by some groups to start flexing our uh, our, our sovereign power. Exactly. Our, uh, yep, flex that sovereign power muscle, if you will. And, and in doing so, you know, we could we can only get so far probably working with uh, other agencies. But I think this is something that needs to go back into Congress. And our ask should be something to the effect of, yes, this is a protected area. But how protected is it when all the issues are happening across the border where we have no policy? So there needs to be a flexibility and to ensure that we're doing proper water quality monitoring on the UNIC. So it's something I think us as tribal leader or tribal staff advise our tribal leaders to take back to Congress to essentially put an asterisk or some kind of something that allows leniency for tribes to be able to get in and out of the UNIC and do the work that needs to be done in a safe manner, not one that's restricted um, based off conserving the area, but one that where there's actual real protection. I just, while well, Sir's going around, I just, Carrie just put up a map. This is why we're having this conversation. This is as of 22 BC mining claims just across the political border. So just to give you c some perspective of why this is such an important issue. Sorry, sir, go ahead. Hi, Gail. Continued onslaught of. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I think one of the first environmental forums that I attended that Clint and Heide did was you were we were talking about um, monitoring and and doing um, database, you know, baseline getting baseline information on the important salmon streams that are coming out of Canada. And I know, I don't know if you know, but it has anything happened with the International Boundary C Commission and, ha you know, really going, I don't think we can do everything, but certainly when we have at least a reasonably friendly administration in Washington, that we could do something to get, um, there's no reason why these foreign corporations should be able to build these huge projects, these huge mines, uh, and we know what's happened. I mean, it's just been a, you know, a lot of very interesting stuff going on politically uh, with BC Hydro and pushing the road up so that they could build um, a large mine. They built a huge mine on the Stikine, the Red Chris, which kind of slipped through, through the cracks as far as uh, no, not a lot of protest about it. But Mount Polly is the Mount Polly spill, the the the, um, the, the dam breach has, is still affecting the the water that is coming out of there, and it flows into the Fraser. I mean, it it flows into Canal Lake, and then that flows into an, uh, into I think the Canal River, and then it's a it's a tributary of the Fraser River, and the Fraser River is an incredibly important salmon stream, also. So, I just I really, I really want to stop these mines from being built. Period. I just, I just think that they're more gold. I mean, do we need more gold? Um, 
I'm, I'm so frustrated by this because we've been at this for so long. And so many of these mines, like the Constantine mine on up above Kowak on the Kohimi, that's a mine that should never even be built because it's like the Tulsa Qua Chief. It's, a, it's an acid ore body, high sulfur body, and these mines should never be opened. They should, they should never be built. So I don't know what the solution is, but um, I'm certainly I'm certainly happy you're doing this stream monitoring. I think it's a great thing, and I'd love to know anything you know about any efforts on the internet with the tribe doing something with the international boundary commission. So I'll stop talking. Thanks, Kay. Um, real quickly, um, so Clinton and Haida still is working to request um, elevation at the federal level, engagement from the International Joint Commission. Um, we adopted a resolution in December of 2022 stating as much, including um, asks for a temporary pause on the permitting of new mines in BC transboundary watersheds, as well as a permanent ban on earthen tailings dams upstream from sensitive habitat and communities. Um, we, Clinkin and Haida has been working really closely with tribes and First Nations in Southeast BC and Northwest Montana and Idaho, um, who are about 100 years ahead of us as it relates to um, mining impacts upstream in Canada, where there is significant International Joint Commission engagement. Um, in statute, it's written that one country can push forward on a um, IJC reference or referral for the commission to review transboundary disputes. Um, but in practice, it's only worked when both countries come to the table. And Canada, until about a week and a half ago, has been dragging uh, their heels on embracing that next step for a re uh, reference on the Elk Valley watershed. Um, we are actively working with tribes in Southeast as well as tribes in Washington state who are working to take more of a proactive and preventative um, approach so as to not arrive at where the Elk Valley watershed is with fish die off and bird deformities. Um, and so we have been working through the IJC process to um, establish watershed boards through a ref referral process. Um, it's kind of cart before the horse in some instances, but we're really wanting to, again, take that preventative measure. Um, and Kay, I assure you that we're doing all that we can to, at every forum, at every table, ensure that Indigenous representation is there, because that is what has been the nature of the beast of this issue, is BC is really good at operating in silos and ensuring that First Nations and tribes are, are not working together. And in fact, they are. Um, we're getting there slow and steady and we're gonna keep, keep doing it. I just think it's wonderful that you're doing this project and that you're involved with other uh, native tribes to help expand that stream monitoring. Hi, Joe. Um, is it, do you have a plan in place or some thoughts about where you'd like to expand as you move forward? For, mo for monitoring in particular? Oh, yeah, yeah, for monitoring. I mean, sediments and fish tissue, right? But also our, um, you know, our migratory species in addition to salmon, but thinking about moose and deer and bear and berries and all of, all of the things. Um, we actually just were awarded um, a, a grant to collaborate between our guardians program and guardians within British Columbia to kind of advance some of those watershed monitoring efforts that BC First Nation guardians programs are underway with already. And so how can we kind of match that and create a holistic watershed monitoring approach? So I just um, wanted to take a moment to comment on what Ray said about the access to wilderness and encourage you to work with us first on a local solution because we have, you know, minimum, we have ways to provide access for things that are required and supported. So just. My apologies. I didn't mean to go over you. No, I just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just kidding. <laughs> I, 
I just want to let, you know, like, I just want to say, like, I think what this, what you guys are doing is, is really important and something that we would support in any way that's feasible within the, the sideboards of the Wilderness Act, but there is quite a bit of leeway around wilderness character and minimum tools and the minimum necessary to achieve the, the goals for managing that area as wilderness. So, and of course, water quality and impacts are one of the things that we preserve those areas for. So just wanna encourage yeah. you to work with us. Greatly appreciate hearing that, Barb. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so following up on that hypothetically, cause I know you, you're part of the forest service here in Juneau, would it be possible to maybe have maybe collaborate with the folks at the Forest Service here in Juneau to um, arrange for transportation to the Unic for Plinkett and Haida specialists to go there? Or does that fall outside of the Juneau Forest Service office? Would that involve collaborating with uh, the Ketchikan Forest Service office? Mm -hmm. I love this because when Klingon and I had first received funding um, from BIA to do monitoring, they signed an MOU with BIA and with USGS and KIC, but Forest Service was not part of that MOU. And so I would submit, it might be time to revisit that and see what we can do to better collaborate on that. A quick question. So the electric John. electric vehicles is that have you are you guys seeing more like are the rare earth metal prospects things like that is that a how's that affecting you guys? I love that question and Ray Ray and I like actually talk about this quite a bit. Um, obviously we have clean hydro here in Southeast that's that's cool but um, I guess I can only say this from my personal perspective. This is not. Um, this is, has not been established uh, uh, through Clinton and Haida. So I, I think I need to, I'm going to be very careful, but I think there's a lot of research out there that suggests, of course, um, we can't mine our way out of a climate crisis, right? And so this transition to a green economy and um, electric vehicles requires more extensive mining. And what the mining industry in Northwest British Columbia They've claimed and and uh, call this area the golden triangle. These are prominently gold mines. These aren't critical minerals. Some some of the projects actually have a small trace amount of a byproduct for trace critical minerals, but that's not the primary target for these projects. Um, and so I guess my response to you, Jonathan, is like I think it's just important for people to be mindful of that. Is that a lot of these renewable energies um, will you know, th there's not enough information out there yet as far as like how much carbon are we offsetting because of the extractive nature of mining that it requires to to create these vehicles. And they use a diesel generator to get them charged. I'm just kidding. One, one. Um, this might be a little bit of a spicy question, but... Um... <laughs> Um, do we know how much of that gold is going into electric vehicles versus how much of that gold is going into, say, jewelry? Because we have a lot of jewelry stores, especially that kind of are associated with the cruise ships. So, yeah, yeah. gold isn't actually required for the creation of these electric vehicles. Um, and there's enough already that's been extracted that if if needed, recycled. Um, I think the I haven't the latest stat is something like ninety three percent of gold that is mined present is used for vanity, so for jewelry. There we go. Hi, yeah. Regarding the the mining, you know, we're America is so let's throw it away stuff, and we go through you know the the electronics that we have. You know, that's where, isn't that where a lot of these treasures are used for? Now, if you watch, you know, any of these documentaries, 
you see that in India and in Africa, you see poor orphans digging around these horrible mounds of rotting gar garbage dumps, mining for this stuff. And the not only um, the for everything they could mine for. And look at our garbage dumps; they're loaded. Let's go start mining at our garbage dumps and start recycling. I think every dump around should have a recycle thing to examine and purge out the the treasures that are being you know i don't know what happens to all of our computers and all the phones and everything else that you know look at the wires everyone has a special wiring that's a lot of copper you know we got to figure out a way to use all this stuff and um not put it in the dumps right making recycling heavy metal or recycling precious metals, uh, making it part of the economy in some form or fashion that needs to be done. So for some of the tribes in here, I, I wanna bring back a question of, you know, with a show of hands, who would be interested in this designing of a collaborative effort? Um, Jen, definitely, yes, thank you, KIC, Wrangle, yes, you guys have definitely uh, in the game. But yeah, I, we do think this is imperative, and we want to be able to use this platform again, the Southeast, Conf sorry, Southeast Tribal Environmental Forum, to help build out these collaborative efforts and, and empower ourselves in that manner. So yeah, I think while there are some tribes right now raising their hands, and we greatly appreciate it, this is something we may have to bring back and create an assessment, and then start looking at how that design may go in the future. Yeah, and I, I think I know a lot of tribes have been talking, and I know you guys are more in the loop on this even than I am, but the need for um, training, right? Training is expensive, so how are tribes coming together to provide training opportunities? Um, and then furthermore, beyond that, um, what are funding needs for tribes? Because I think that they're, like, we all know this, right? There's a, there are a lot of resources out there right now, but navigating that is a challenge. And so, however, I can be helpful for you and your community um, to help help you uh, build out whatever monitoring, whatever governance or or uh, advocacy you you need support with on this issue. Like, please think of us as a resource. And I think I'm going to keep just being the squeaky wheel with Ray and say like. I think we need to have a two, at least two day workshop just on this issue and not just the challenge of mining, of course, but like what are some of the really cool projects that we could build out together and then even work across that political border to expand them um, into Canada. So just planting those seeds for future, future thought. Um, sorry, I swear this is the last time. Um, as far as training goes, um, I guess maybe water quality training. I know I came to Juno back in February to get in-person water quality training with uh, Jim Hamlin, who had worked with the, the US Geological Survey at the time. So I'm wondering, it wasn't just collecting the samples, it was actually processing them in the lab. So I'm wondering if that could be a possible collaboration with USGS. Maybe? Have anyone from GS here? Oh. Um, I think we can bring forward that ask because I think one thing too that we learned in this as Lindsay said like it's important to be doing data reconciliation like right after you're taking samples right so we right. don't have these backlogs and so that we can all be sharing that information more timely um, and so yeah I, I think so like how every aspect of monitoring um, I think I think we could build that into to a training for sure. We have talked to USGS about it. Um, their official water quality training is two weeks long in Denver. <laughs> and um, we've been told a week of it is on groundwater. So not something that we would necessarily need. So we were trying to look at a potential shorter workshop and um, we haven't got much further than that, I don't think. No, but we are currently looking at that. Like Lindsay said, uh, we're chatting with Chris Whitehead at Ocean and Earth. Um, and I know many of you guys at the tribes have been working with Chris as well. And so this is really that uniform collaborative effort, if you will, in the long run that we're looking at. And so 
as Lindsay mentioned, we're, we're trying to figure that out. I think there's a possibility we may look to host a spring water quality monitoring training. Still not sure what, probably March, April, but that's still to be determined. Uh, so um, I work with, um, I, I've been in contact with Maddie Novak, and they are doing a um, project um, from the salt chuck mine. It's an old mine from way back when, got tons of tailings there. Um, it's really old. And they are doing a, a remediation project where they have biochar that they've put in the water, and they are supposed to collect it this year to see if you can remove the heavy metals from the mine because there's still stuff coming from that mine even though it's been remediated or been fixed they said cleaned up but um so they're doing a, um the biochar um project to see if they can remove the copper and the heavy metals that are coming from the mine um so it does not affect the fish because it is it is in an area a nursery area where the animals you know the the water aquatic life that's where their nursery is where that's where they nurse their babies and uh, it's got eel grass and it's just beautiful and stuff even though the beach is dead because of the mine but they're trying that and we should find out here pretty soon um what the outcome was with that so it's just a thought of you know biochar which is you know has just come up in the last few years um using biochar for a lot of stuff whether it be for that or gardening or you know but um it's just a thought I love it. Yeah, there's a lot of ingenuity right now about diff yeah, different products that can help pull those metals. I think that's sweet. I think in um, you know, just everything running through my head right now as we're doing this discussion, you know, we mentioned the training and Lindsay brought some stuff up and we're hearing everything that you guys are saying. I, I think as we're looking to design out this spring water quality sampling training i would really love to um, invite our federal partners to be a part of that to help design it out so the forest service the usgs and everyone involved with water quality sampling and and what it means on the land and the water uh, i think that's something we're going to reach out to you guys at to help design that out and where you know what that may look like where the power lies in that and and best approaches so i'm putting that out there to my federal friends <laughs> And I will say too, EPA has offered support, like technical support for quap preparations and, um, you know, whatever they can. They, while we haven't seen a final appropriations bill within the Senate appropriations bill, EPA has been finally awarded um, some funding to support tribal capacity on this issue, not just in Alaska, but also Washington, Idaho, and Montana as well. So I think that's a great idea, Ray, is to invite the federal family to. Yeah, for sure. Sort of getting his steps in. Yeah, dog. I was wondering what um, water sampling looks like at the headwaters of the Chilkat River where this mining exploration is underway with the, the pro proposed earthen dam. Does Daniel want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Daniel Planot with uh, the Chilkat Indian Village uh, has been working a little bit on that. He may have some um, definitely some thoughts and <laughs> comments in regards to that. <laughs> He's trying to figure out how to say it nicely. What was the question? <clears throat> I'm just trying to find a picture, but. What has monitoring been like uh, on the Chilkat for you? It's been interesting. Getting to work with Sir and Lindsay a lot these past couple of years, getting that baseline water study done. Just different between summer and winter summertime at one of the spots mosquitoes are terrible in the other spot they're just kind of bad and when we're out in the field doing all this we can't use sunscreen bug dope anything that might change or affect the sampling so it's like you're there 
And the last time we were all out there, everybody was smart enough to bring their net but me. I'm like, ah, we're almost done. <laughs> and the trade off is wintertime. We have to crawl through snow. And I'd say at least a couple of times where the three of us have to crawl kind of hand and knees for about 30 feet to get to one location, cussing at the people that are 165 pounds to just walk like, we're the moose, you're the, <laughs> we're the moose, you're the wolves, because we're sinking. And he's like, been trying to get the village to get a snow machine to help out with that, but our tribal administrator won't budge on it. It's like, I swear we're going to use it for good. But it's been fun, and I'm really happy for the opportunity that I've gotten to be a part of this. And I hope it helps us out in the long run, and it should. Yeah, um, the, the Klehini and the Chilkat has been the one consistent river we've been able to do. Again, consistent sampling in the summer and the winter because it's on the road system. The Taku, the Stikine, um, the Alsec, those are all more challenges during winter time. As you know, there's no roads to get up there. So, um, you know, and we can't put any of uh, the safety, uh, the lives of our staff in, in danger just to, to get those samples. So, yeah, we always have to wait till spring and summer with those, those rivers. I might make a comment. I know just from being out in the field doing the sampling, um, <clears throat> one of the most recent times we went uh, on the Chilka and the Klehini up in Haines was uh, we ran across uh, the USGS that were out there, but we were doing our sampling and then they came and kind of observed and uh, we were able to chit chat about some of their sampling processes. Um, but there were some interesting questions. One of them was about uh, how us as Clinkett and Haida, we do our samplings uh, you know, out on shore or like just, you know, very close to shore, like very isolated areas or not isolated, but very um, just close to the shore, uh, grabbing the grabs, doing the grabs, doing sediment sampling uh, versus when we watched them doing their samples, they were uh, doing uh, several point-based samplings all the way across the streams uh, and doing one upstream and also downstream of a couple of the bridges that cross over the, the rivers. Um, but then they were just, upon discussion with them, they were talking about how, uh, you know, obviously theirs is going to kind of capture more of a, a, a well-rounded uh, analysis of, of like what's actually going through the stream. And I know they're doing a lot uh, of different monitoring, uh, not just uh, the, the heavy metals that we're doing, but um, there was discussion of like, you know, what if they, would, they mentioned that maybe that's something we could look into as far as uh, just kind of expand, when we talk about expanding our, uh, our monitoring something to include uh, the whole stream, like from one side to the other. And I know it, it can be difficult because several of the streams are very fast moving and very big. Um, but that was just one of the things that kind of been kicking around in my brain is like, is when we think about ways of expanding our, our program and uh, broadening our, our, our monitoring efforts, like something that kind of goes along with what they're kind of doing is doing, getting a more broader view of what's actually going through the through the waters. That that sounds awesome, and I wish we could do that. I'm not saying we can't, but as Jill mentioned, sampling in, in Alaska is expensive, and getting our samples once we do get our samples to ship them up to Anchorage and Put have plug for that Southeast Lab. Yeah, Meredith. yeah, and have and ship those samples up. Just we do uh, we sample two sites per river, correct? And and that cost is about just to get those samples and get them up there that's about four grand and and that's you know that's not cheap and that don't even take into account of uh paying for the transportation to get to where we're going the the hotel i mean all the other logistics behind it and so this this project is insanely expensive and to be able to do that would take a, a you know a federal agency type of money to be able to to do that but as jill said you know this is a great plug for uh, us having a lab in in southeast alaska especially a, a tribal friendly lab if you will um, that's something that we would look to offset some of those costs um, but also enhance our our capacity to have uh, credible science i didn't think that we'd be able to take the whole amount of time but we did 
we got some more questions. Um, hi, uh, yeah, as you know, we've also been doing sampling on the ALSAC and we're working pretty closely together. Um, we do appreciate you guys. Um, I guess I don't, I haven't been to the ALSAC with you, so I can't speak for where you're pulling your sample from. I have seen some data um, that does suggest that ALSAC Lake is kind of acting as a natural filter. Um, I was wondering about getting sample sites moved up above um, the lake. Like, are, are you guys doing that, or um, is there plans to do that? Do you have plans to move your sample site above the lake? Um, so we did talk with Brant about doing a sample site above the lake, and he said it is possible. Mm -hmm. So we would just need to um, try it out, see how it works. Um, we're working on our clap. We're hoping to have it done by next summer. And um, yeah, I I want to get above the lake. Thank you. If possible, Nicole, I'd like to reach out to you also. and. As we're designing out this quap, have your guys' input as well, so that again, there's that uniformed effort. And just to build on that, um, I know just a conversation with Kathy with Kai Environmental, she did mention some questions about uh, us possibly moving the sampling site either to the lake or even above the lake, like you mentioned. Um, if it is acting like as a as a natural filter, um, you know what at what cost or at what point you know are we really concerned with something that's above the lake because if it's filtering out at the lake and coming down um just kind of gauging like where, where, where what's our stance like as far as if it's you know feasibility and uh, what's it going to cost to like to do that i mean if it's if it's already doing like its filtering process at the lake um but that was just some questions you know, like to kind of put out there like that we're going to consider uh, for obviously expanding that site Well, any more questions or comments? I think we can kind of keep going a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm excited it, about this program right now and what we've done, where we're at, and, and what we're going to be expanding on. I feel like, um, you know, over the years, you know, I, as many of you know, I've been working uh, for the tribe and in this position almost two decades. Um, and through those years, I've watched each tribe develop that capacity as w uh, us as well. And it's exciting to see where we're at right now versus where we were 10 years ago and what we're going to be in the next, you know, five to 10 years, especially after watching uh, the AYS kids do their presentation, our next leaders coming up, being able to sit in here with us and, and get an idea of the work that we're doing. And, and this is stuff that may spark their interest in the long run. And yeah, super exciting. So. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys. We were going to do a PowerPoint, but we've done a PowerPoint in the past, and we kind of just follow it. So I, I'm glad Jill just said, let's have a discussion. And I think a lot more came out of it than just us having a PowerPoint. And, and yeah, so thank you guys for all the, the feedback and, and your efforts and the work you guys are doing. Lindsay? So we are about, I want to say we had one more agenda item on there, and it was uh, Santina and Jonathan Law with the EPA to kind of discuss a, a youth ambassador program, but um, I, we weren't able to get that situated. So now we're, we, what we can offer is the tribes that are certain that are in here right now um, have an opportunity to meet Jonathan if you have not met him. And so essentially, this is kind of the end of the day today. Um, for those tribes who want to stick around or anyone else within the conference, not just tribes, um, stick around and, and get a chance to meet Jonathan. He will be here for, for a little while. Jonathan, if you want to raise your hand just in case. Yeah. So again, Jonathan is our new project officer at the EPA. We've had a um, Michelle Davis, who uh, is, is Clinkett, um, is my cousin, and, and she was our project officer in Southeast Alaska for almost 15 years or so. And, she, I think she has been insanely integral in helping us as tribes design out our programs and really pushing us to be the best that we can be. And, um, Michelle is greatly missed, but this is also another opportunity to um, have another great 
uh, EPA staffers and working with us. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here.